Okay. As chair of the House Ways and Means Committee, I find that due to the state of emergency declared by the governor as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic, and in accordance with the House Rule 67 and the Governor's Emergency Order Number 12, pursuant to Executive Order 2020-04, this is a public body. This public body is authorized to meet electronically. This is a public hearing of bills referred to the Ways and Means Committee. Executive sessions on pending legislation may be held. Please note that there is no physical location for members of the public to observe and listen contemporaneously to this meeting. However, in accordance with the emergency order, I am confirming that all members of the committee and select legislative staff have the ability to communicate contemporaneously during the meeting through the Zoom electronic meeting platform, and the public has access, access to contemporaneously listen and, if necessary, participate in this meeting by the Zoom platform or by telephone. All necessary access information has been made available to the House calendar and the House calendar and through the electronic calendar on the general court website. This, the notice of this meeting complies with the House rules and RSA 91A. Anyone who has a problem accessing the meeting could call 271-3600 or email hcs at leg.state.nh.us. In the event the public is unable to access the meeting, the meeting will be adjourned and rescheduled. I want to introduce the staff that are on the meeting assisting us, Jennifer Poor and, and the committee researcher. Please note that all votes that are taken during this meeting should be done by roll call vote. Let's start the meeting by taking a roll call attendance. When each member states their presence, please also state whether there is anyone in the room with you during this meeting, which is required under the right to know law. Thank you. Okay, Representative Bernstein, you can do the roll call. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good morning to you and good morning to everyone. It's nice to see everyone again. Today is April 27th, 2021. It's currently 9.37 a.m. We'll begin roll call with Representative Patrick Abrami. In my home in Stratum, I'm, I'm here alone. Thank you. Representative Mary Griffin. Representative Jordan O'Leary. I'm here, the wife is in the house. Good morning. Representative Ober. Here in Hudson with the usual six felines. And from Salem, Representative Fred Doucette. Good morning in my home office in Salem. I do have uh, somebody working on another part of the house. Your clerk is Alan Burstein. I'm at my home office in beautiful Nottingham, New Hampshire. <laughs> Representative Elliott. Here in Salem, New Hampshire at my daughter's house. Um, she's in the house somewhere. Representative Janigian. I am at my house in Salem and my wife is somewhere in the house. Representative Herschel Nunez. Representative Baxter. Thank you, Mr. Clerk. I apologize that my camera isn't working. I'm not sure why, but I'm in Florida on vacation, but still ready for a committee. Um, I'm alone right now, but there may be people coming through, just so you know. Well, good morning. And when your camera is working, we all want to see some tan lines, okay? <laughs> Representative Spillsbury. Good morning, home alone in Charles Town. Representative Tudor. Home in uh, Northwood, New Hampshire, wife and grandkids are upstairs. Representative Almy. Home in Lebanon, alone, thanks. Representative Ames. Yes, I'm here in Jaffrey, alone in my home office. And Representative Southworth, how are things in Dover this morning? Great, I'm here in Dover, alone. Thank you. Representative Malloy. Uh, here, uh, Greenland alone. Representative Thomas Schamberg. I am present. Uh, Representative Bernstein in my home. My wife's in her office. Good morning. Representative Tucker. I'm here in Randolph uh, alone. And from Swansea, Representative Gomarlo. I am here in sunny Swansea alone right now, but my husband wanders in, around, in and out. So. Representative Lofman. Representative Tom Lofman. Representative Gorg. Good morning, I am present and alone. Representative Hacken Phillips. Morning, I'm alone coming to you from my office in Concord. Representative James Murphy. Good morning, I am in my office alone in Hanover. And our esteemed chair, Representative Norman Major. Good morning, I'm in my home in Plasto and my wife is in the house. 
Mr. Chair, there are 21 members present, three are absent. Thank you, Representative Bernstein. The first public hearing is for Senate Bill 139-FN, an act relative to bingo dates. And the, hold on a second. There's the prime sponsor. Let me see. Is Senator Abard. I just promoted her uh, her replacement. Is it a replacement? Uh, her name is I don't know. Hi, right. it's Trisha Malillo for yeah. Senator Avard. And I assume you're going to introduce House uh, Senate Bill 139-FN. Yes, sir. Okay, the floor is all yours. Okay, thank you. Good morning, Mr. Chair and members of the House Ways and Means Committee. My name is Tricia Malillo. I am the legislative aide for Senator Kevin Avard here to introduce Senate Bill 139. This bill, 139 FN, excuse me. This bill increases the number of game dates allowed for bingo games per month from 10 to 16 a month and 192 games um, a year. And um, that is basically the bill. I probably cannot answer any questions for you. Um, Senator Avard had a conflict this morning. Oh, well, thank and you. Also, I'm sorry, Senator Rosenwald is a co-sponsor on this bill. Um, she did not get, um, it was printed before they got her name on it. All right. And is Senator Rosenwald available? Uh, she is not available this morning. Okay. All right. Uh, is that it? Uh, Yes, thank you. Okay. Well, thank you for your testimony. Thank you. And you, you are not gonna take any questions, right? No, no, sir, sorry. On the um, sign up sheet, there was only one person signed up, a member of the public in opposition and is not testifying. Does anybody else have anything to say on Senate Bill 139? We have an attendee with his hand up, Michael McLaughlin and Paul Laflamme also. Okay, would you like? Okay, I'm gonna allow them to talk. Yes. Michael first. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. My name is Michael McLaughlin. I apologize for not signing in earlier. Uh, and I represent Community Bingo in Manchester and Arrow International, which is a bingo uh, products manufacturer. The only concern we have relative to the bill is for many, many years, we've had the limit of 10 games per month, which has created a, uh, a paradigm where a commercial gaming hall, a uh, bingo hall in New Hampshire, of which there are 15 of them, can provide services to uh, at least three charities per month. That's about 30 days and 120 per uh, year. This bill right now is, is, it is some unintended consequences by pushing it up to 16 opportunities per month for a bingo event, uh, where we see the issue that a commercial hall could then literally only operate with two charities uh, for the 32 days or the 30 days of the month, where the net unintended result would be the elimination of certain charities in commercial halls. I recognize there's... Uh, an opportunity for sole charities who see open dates and open opportunities to have additional dates. But I, we also wanted to make the committee aware that there is the possibility that by increasing the per charity date per month, a commercial hall who is interested in, you know, efficiencies of operation can say to a lower performing charity, uh, we're only going to use two charities for our hall. Interestingly, the charitable bingo halls collect revenue on a uh, foot traffic paradigm, meaning more people show up at $5 or, or $7 a night. That's where they get the revenue. Charities perform at different levels in commercial halls. Charities uh, really that have the carryover cover all bingo games draw in the most people. So uh, commercial bingo halls 
best interest would be to service charities who bring them more foot traffic. So it there are issues on both sides, and Mr. LeFam will tell his issues, but I wanted the committee to be aware that the uh, 10 events per month as it exists today is more beneficial to more charities across the state. Thank you very much. Mr. McLaughlin, I have two questions. Are you a lobbyist? Yes, I, I did sign in this morning on the uh, and sent some testimony late. That's why I apologize. I'm a lobbyist for Arrow International and Community Bingo. And the record, I think, will show when you pull it up that I did put it in this morning a little late, but I apologize for that. And the other question is, are you in support or opposition? Opposition. Okay. Thank you. Questions from the committee? Uh, Representative Almy, followed by Representative Bronwyn. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think I'm a little, a little behind in what has happened to regular bingo in this state. We don't hear about it hardly at all anymore. Um, you're, you're saying that the main revenue is that the people who want to play bingo pay an entry fee? Commercial bingo halls are by um, administrative rule their revenue comes from the number of people who go to the hall. So when you uh, open the doors of the hall, you have 100 people. The commercial bingo hall, their revenue source is the number of persons attending. So this is now in the rules. No, this is, yes, it's in the rules, but it's, it's the only revenue that a bingo hall, a commercial bingo hall, is allowed to collect. The charity gets the, the revenue from Lucky Sevens, and from their percentage of the um, the take on the bingo game. Thank you very much. Representative Bromley. Chair, um, hi Mike, how are you? Very well, thank you. Um, so, well, I just wanna understand, is that uh, uh, bingo, bingo, <laughs> every time we come back to bingo, I get to re be re-educated. Uh, we have the commercial halls, I know, even some charitable gaming locations have bingo, uh, but, but this first, you know, um, the first, is, are, is bingo also occurring in, in church basements still? And, uh, and is this what this bill is really trying to address, that and not the commercial locations? I would think so. And I think that's the, um, the, the dilemma you have to deal with in that um, a commercial bingo hall, there are standalone bingos. Uh, there are bingos that uh, operate in commercial halls where there may be open nights. Uh, if you have a lower performing commercial hall that has 20 nights a month filled up, uh, that charity in that area might say, why can't I have nights 12, 13, and 14 to enhance my revenue? And that's a, a valid point. But a high performing commercial bingo hall may say, because of this bill, uh, I don't need charities X and Y that don't bring me any people. I'll take charities A and B because they're filling the hall every night. And one of the things that I think is important to remember, bingo is not a standalone product. It's like a loss leader for lucky seven sales. So it's bingo lucky seven. In addition, the main driver of attendance at commercial bingo halls is the carryover coverall games, which are played once a night and can have jackpots from fifty to sixty to seventy thousand dollars. So, a high-performing charity that creates a um, large carryover coverall uh, is going to attract more foot traffic to the commercial hall. But again, this is—I'm looking at this as an unintended consequence of allowing every charity they have 16 um, dates per month we had some discussion in the senate about uh individual charities being able to petition the lottery and say hey we've got open dates in our locale can we have them uh, and i think that would be a better opportunity than to carte blanche give the 16 uh, available dates to any charity that wants to take them a follow-up mr chair follow up so that's, again, Mike, I just want to understand. So I, I see that this does impact the, the commercial halls, but was that the intent to, to for this bill to really uh, cover the commercial halls? As no, this, this bill is this bill is not uh, was not put forth by the commercial halls at all. We've had this bill in the past, but this this is not a bill 
that uh, the commercial hall I represent supports. So it is not a uh, an effort by a commercial hall to excise any charities. It just happened to pop up because there's a situation, of just a missile film I'm sure will explain, that his particular charity is denied the opportunities to have extra dates. This is not a charitable hall initiative. But if the church down the street decides to have bingo night, I, I looked this up just this morning. Uh, uh, so it looks like the, the license fee per day for a non-commercial location is $25 a day to have a license to do bingo. So I'm assuming that that, that still exists, that bingo could be played in any location that's, that you know pays the, the, meets the criteria and pays the license fee. Commercial halls play a license fee of 250 a year. Uh, so, so again, I'm just trying to understand the intent of by which the senator was here uh, to understand that. I, I can reach out to the senator to understand um, was the intent to modify what the, the, the charitable game. I mean, obviously, he says I get no commercial invoice when he electronically scans it in. Yeah, no, please. Um, line again. Oh, who was that? So, anyway, um, the, um, it looks like because it also increases the, the uh, number of games per uh, calendar month from 120 to 192. So uh, I, I'm, I'm just trying to divide out commercial halls for all other bingo that may be occurring. Um, and I, I'll, I'll, I'll probably, Mr. Chair, I'll probably reach out to the prime sponsor to understand what the motivation was. You have a good question there. Representative Bromney. Yeah. Thank you. Any further you. questions of Mr. McLaughlin? Seeing none, then uh, would you uh, like Mr. Chairman, uh, Representative Tucker had her hand up, and I just put mine up after. Okay, sorry about that. And Representative Tucker. I'm not a bingo aficionado, really, but I didn't understand what uh, the testifier said about some sort of game that is a once a night with a big pot. I didn't understand the word that he used. It's, uh, ma ma Madam Representative, the carryover coverall bingo tell me, game. Yeah, tell me what that word is. Carry, it sounds like carryover. It's, well, each what? night, if the bingo numbers that are put forth are not all covered, meaning all of the numbers or the beat all the numbers on the card are not covered the money bet carries over to the next bingo event of the carryover coverall game so the money builds up every night until the carryover is covered completely by one player there are certain prizes come along each evening but you have to cover all the numbers in one session to win the prize so it, it carries over from event to event to event. And the jackpot grows and grows and grows. And if you look at a social media site for a charity, they'll be advertising that their carryover coverall game has a jackpot now of 30,000 or 40,000 or 20,000. And that drives the bingo community to that hall. I see. So I really didn't understand. Thank you very much. Uh, Representative Almey. Thank you. I just wanted to make sure we're we going to have the lottery talking to us about this since we can't have any either of the sponsors. <laughs> um, attendee. Do we have anybody from lottery? Representative Major? Yes. Uh, Gregory Moore is, is an attendee now. He, he was on the sign up sheet. And Valerie King is here. Valerie. That's who we need is Valerie. She knows this best. Valerie does lottery. But we ought to listen first to the, the right. two now, apparently, in the audience. As far as I know, as I know right now, one of the one other attendee wanted to speak. Are you yes. saying more than that now? Um, well, Gregory Moore had signed up on the sheet, and then there's Paul Laflam. Who has his hand up? And I just admitted Valerie King. She can I do. Uh, 
I only have one person that signed up on my sheet. Hmm. I have, I actually have Donna Susie and Greg Moore, but Donna Susie is not here. This is one of, oh, I'm sorry. I've got the wrong darn bill. I pulled up the wrong one, sorry. Okay. 101 instead of 139. Let me grab that one. Uh, <laughs> Valerie is in there. Okay, then what we're going to do, we'll listen to uh, Paul Laflamme and then Valerie. Okay, let me let him talk. Okay. Hi, Mr. Chairman, members of the community. Thank you so much for allowing me to speak. I apologize for not signing up ahead of time. I didn't realize there was an 8.30 time cut off and I was there at nine o'clock signing up and, and was unsuccessful. So I, I really appreciate you um, allowing me the courtesy of speaking now. Before you um, start speaking, Paul, are you a lobbyist and are you uh, opposed or in favor? Sure. Um, I am not a lobbyist. I am the executive director of the Spartans Drum and Bugle Corps. I am also employed by Symphony New Hampshire as a production manager. Both those organizations operate bingo down here in Nashua. And so I'm speaking on behalf of those two organizations uh, as well as myself. Thank you, continue. All right, thank you again. Um, so the Spartans have been doing bingo since uh, as long as I can remember. My grandfather founded the organization. Uh, so I remember growing up and my parents going off to, to work bingo. And so we've been doing it literally forever. Um, and uh, this bill comes uh, as a request from me and the Spartans and Symphony New Hampshire to both our senators down here, Senator Avard and Rosenwald. So um, I was very excited to have both of them uh, as co-sponsors of this bill and the motivation uh, on their part, I know that was a big concern of the committee here is uh, very simple. The Spartans would like to run more bingo. And um, we think that um, the time has come to allow us to, to do that. Um, the, the bill, I know that a lot, of, a lot of discussion has occurred this morning. It really is as simple as we wanna go from 10 dates a month to 16 dates a month. Now, what, why is that? Um, here in Nashua, for example, at the Nashua Bingo Hall, uh, which is a commercial hall, we have been closed on Wednesdays for about a year. Now, why have we been closed on Wednesdays for about a year? Because we don't have any charities interested in taking on the responsibility of running bingo. Are you still there? We can't hear you anymore. Mr. Laflamme, we don't hear you. Okay, shoot, can you hear me now? Yes. All right, I apologize for that. Not sure what happened, but there's two types of charities. Ones that do the great walkathons and the galas, and they have a large number of volunteers that work for a short period of time on a project. Then there's smaller charities like the Spartans who have a smaller group of passionate volunteers who are willing to do one night or two nights a week on a, on a more specific type of project. And that's what we do. And we're good at it. Um, so we would like to, quite frankly, we would like to operate on Wednesdays at the National Bingo Hall. The idea that there is this pent up demand for charities that want to take on the huge task of running a bingo and that there's like this waiting list to get into a commercial hall is just a false narrative. It's not true. Um, if you were a commercial operator, I'm going to just ask you guys to think about this for a second. Would it benefit you to run a hall with two charities or would it benefit you to run a hall with seven charities? What if a charity went out of business? You're, you wanna put more charities in your hall, have your eggs in more baskets, but you also wanna be open. So if you can't find charities to operate, wouldn't it be good to be able to um, use your charities that you already have to fill that need? Um, the consequences of being closed on Wednesdays, the hall owner has not collected any rent, has not collected that $5 a head that Mr. McLaughlin spoke about. So, so he's losing that revenue. There is a owner of the kitchen, the, the concession service who has been closed. He's not seen any revenue. The kitchen staff has not received uh, you know, wages for this period of time because we're closed. And of course the Spartans or any other charity that might go in there has not received any, um, any of their profits. 
Uh, and quite frankly, the Spartans could have used them in these tough COVID times. Not to mention the state of New Hampshire has not received any tax revenue. Now, yes, I know there was been a mention of the $25 a night license fee as outlined in the fiscal note, and that is true. I would also point out the state has not received the 7% tax on the winner take alls and the carryover coveralls, which on an average night for the Spartans, and I'm sure there are charities with different types of averages, but on um, if the Spartans had been operating for that one extra night, the state would have generated during this time frame roughly $15,000 in extra revenue for doing nothing other than allowing us to operate. Um, the, the fiscal note talks about the $25 per game date as a, as a possible consequence of, of this bill. It does not talk about the 7% tax using the same logic that the fiscal note uses, multiplying by 200, which I don't think any charity is going to, um, you know, use the maximum number of dates, but that's an extra $3.4 million just using the Spartans averages. So um, the state has, has, a, has an interest in, in allowing this bill to go forward as well. Um, the bill is, um, like I said, very simple. Um, please don't try to confuse it with, with foot traffic and carryover coveralls and uh, the differences between the commercial halls and, and the church basement bingos. Uh, Mr. McLaughlin uh, suggested there are 15 commercial halls in the state. Uh, multiply that by the three charities required to, to run it. That's 75 um, uh, game dates. The, uh, the fiscal note talks about there's 200, or I'm sorry, 75 charities running in a commercial bingo hall, I meant to say. Um, the, the fiscal note talks about 200 charities running bingo at this time. So it's not, the, the commercial halls are not even half of the bingos running in the state. So I think that that's a, it's a, it's a, it's a herring that is not even a, a consideration for this bill. Um, but other than that, I'm happy to answer questions. Um, I have been doing bingo for way too long as um, Valerie King will testify to, she would be happy to get rid of me um, and um, happy to answer any questions. Thank you for your question, Mr. Flynn. Uh, Representative, Bromney, followed by Representative Alley. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Flam, for your uh, testimony. I just want to understand, I, the key thing I want to make sure is that we're not going to be boxing out any charities that uh, already have dates. Uh, uh, so uh, your testimony says that that's not going to happen because uh, all the dates aren't taken, but you're saying it's only closed on a Wednesday. So I'm trying to reconcile that. If it's only closed on a Wednesday, I can see it being closed one Wednesday a week because it, at the current rule maximum of 10 days, that's 30 days and on a 31 day month, one day have to be, you have to be closed. Uh, but it says no more than 10 days and this would be no more than 16 days. Right. But here's, my, here's my question really is, who controls the dates? Is it, is it your, like your facility in Nashville that you utilize, do they control the dates that they give to different charities to do this? So we have a lease with the hall owner that lease states that we um, can operate on certain dates and we agree to that. Now you can't just take them away without breaking the lease. The reason why there is a disconnect between the number of dates and, and um, that are allowed and the, the closed on Wednesdays in practice, charities typically pick one day a week to, to run their game. So like the Spartans do Mondays and Tuesdays. So, uh, and that has to do with, um, uh, lucky seven bonuses and, and you don't want to, you don't want to use your lucky seven bonuses that you develop over time on a Monday and then give them away to your, to uh, somebody that might win it on a Wednesday. Um, the players get upset about that because they feel that's their money, et cetera. Um, so, so typically we do just one day a week. So and obviously with 10 days currently allowed, some months have five Mondays and five Tuesdays. So I've maxed out. Other months might have only four Mondays and five Tuesdays. So I only get to do nine dates that month just because of the logistics of the way a day of the week works because there's only one Wednesday in the week, obviously. Um, so this would allow a charity to do um, 
you know, in my case, a Monday, a Tuesday, and a Wednesday. There may be some weeks where, or some months rather, that we can't do all. Uh, you might ask, why is there 16 and not 15? Well, that's to, to cover um, fluctuations in the calendar where you might have more more day, more Mondays, more Tuesdays, less Mondays, more Wednesdays, et cetera. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Appreciate your testimony. Representative Alamy, followed by Representative Schamberg. Representative Alamy, you're muted. Yeah, I think I'm going to pass. I'm incredibly confused by all of these um, date, date issues. Representative Schamberg. Yes, thank, for your, thank you for your testimony. Can you answer the question, will church bingos be able to move up or, or at, to 16 or do they have an unlimited number now? No, they would be able to move up to 16 as well. So all the, unlike uh, the poker rooms where um, the, 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 the poker room operator um, controls the games and runs the games and there's also a waiting list to get in, Bingo is different. The charities run the games themselves. A bona fide member needs to be present to run the games. Um, so even in the, it, this will be treated the exact same in a commercial hall as well as a church basement. Thank you very much. Any further questions? Saying none, thank you. Janine, would you let Valerie Kingham. Uh, Valerie's in, and Mike Michael um, McLaughlin has a has his hand up again. No, I don't. No, you don't. No. <laughs> okay. I just lowered maybe, it. Maybe I never lowered it. I'm sorry. Thank you. I thought I had. Okay, Valerie. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and committee members. From my name is Valerie King with New Hampshire Lottery. Um, I'm here to answer any questions you have. I think Paul did a great job explaining it, but I, I can answer any additional questions you have. Any questions for Valerie? Uh, no, I'm, uh, yeah. No, Representative Ab Abrami. I couldn't find my, my hand button here. So, um, hi Valerie, how are you? Uh, so, so I just want to make sure we understand. So this this affects both the the church charities, as well as the the uh, the, the the halls. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. And uh, so it is different than charitable gaming. It sounds like in terms of how the how the dates are controlled. Is that correct? Um, just to clarify, uh, bingo is a charitable game. I think you're referring to games of chance. Um, our poker rooms, and yes, it's it's totally different regulations, totally different set of uh, rules and number of dates allowed. Right. Uh, but the last question um, is: Is there a backlog of charities that want to get involved or not? We're not aware of any waiting lists. Um, we don't maintain a waiting list, but we haven't received any complaints. I'm not aware of any complaints of uh, charities not being able to play bingo. Okay, thank you. Any further questions for Mrs. King? Yes, um, I do. Representative Elmy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, do we, is there, if there are very few uh, charities that want to sponsor bingo, is there really a reason why we are limiting, then what is the reasoning for limiting the number of days at this point? And I have another question about the, the derivatives of the church basements. So I, I can't speak to the uh, original intent of the 10 game dates per month. My assumption, I mean, this, this, the legislation goes back to when I was in high school and probably before, which was a long time ago. Um, but I, I would assume that it had to do with uh, bingo used to be a much more popular game. Um, so they probably did need to limit it at that time. 
it has been a dying game. There, it's it's shrinking in size. The number of uh, of charities willing to do it and whatnot. So um, I don't believe that there's a need to put that cap any longer. Thank you. And the other question I've got is about um, senior centers. Our senior center does penny ante, penny bingo, actually, penny a card. On um, how are they regulated at this point? Um, de depending upon how they actually run their games, they may be exempt. There are senior bingos that are exempt. They have to follow certain criteria, but they can they are exempt. Thank you. That would be them. Any further questions of Mrs. King? Seeing none, do we have anybody else waiting? Uh, Janine? Not that I can see. Thank you. Then I'm going to close the public hearing on Senate Bill 139-FF. The next public hearing has to do with Senate Bill 101-FN, an act increasing the minimum gross business income required for filing a business profits tax. And Senator Sosi is the prime sponsor. And she wants um, to testify. I don't see Senator Susi, but Senator Bradley has his hand raised. Then um, why don't we let Senator Bradley? Okay. Senator Bradley, it's all yours. Good morning, Mr. Chair. I think I had signed on for Senate Bill 3, but since Senator Susi is not here, I believe Senate Bill 101 is a bill that lifts the threshold on filing the business profits tax from 50 to $75,000. And as I recall, it passed the Senate unanimously and we commend it to you. And I just promoted uh, Senator Susi. My apologies. Okay, Senator Susi. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. For the record, I'm Donna Susi, and I'm the prime sponsor of Senate Bill 101. I represent Senate District 18, which is Manchester's wards five through nine in the town of Litchfield. Uh, this bill is a bill to increase the threshold for filing a business profits tax return. The current threshold is gross business income in excess of $50,000. This bill would raise that threshold to gross business income in excess of $75,000. And it would apply to the taxable period beginning after December 31st, 2021. The bill would take effect on July 1st of 2021. Um, most importantly, though, I think the committee should be aware, um, the current limit was set in 1993. It has been 27 years, and I believe that we should be increasing the threshold at the very least to keep up with inflation. But I also think it's critical that we look at these thresholds, um, particularly during these times, because the increase of the threshold would lift a regulatory burden off so many of our small businesses and sole proprietorships, um, reduce administrative costs, and also reduce accounting fees for so many of them. Um, the department has included a fiscal note, as you can see, it is based on some data from 2018, but it does show that even using those numbers, thousands of ben businesses would benefit from increasing this threshold. And I would encourage the committee to vote ought to pass. Um, this was a bill that was unanimously voted upon in the Senate last year. Uh, it has been unanimous again this year. So it certainly has bipartisan support. And as I said, I would encourage you to vote ought to pass. Would be happy to answer any questions, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Sosi. 
Um, any questions from the committee? Hold on one second. Representative Yuri. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for taking my question, Senator Susi. Uh, when the Senate uh, discussed this, did they discuss raising it even higher? Because uh, you mentioned uh, keeping pace with inflation, and I don't disagree that 75000 is a nice move. But why was not uh, 100, 125, or 150 considered? Uh, or did it even come up in the Senate discussions? Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, Representative Ulrey. Um, the question of whether to raise it even beyond that did not come up. Um, in the conversation. Uh, I think it certainly, if you were to raise it beyond the 75, would once again encompass many more businesses. Therefore, it may have an additional cost associated with it. But the question of 100,000 or 125 was not debated um, in the Senate Ways and Means Committee. Any further questions? Um, yes. Yes, Representative. Uh, yes, Mr. Chair. You have a follow-up? Uh, follow-up, please. Yes. Uh, Senator Susi, do you think your, uh, your committee or the Senate as a whole would be adverse to raising the 75 to 100? Uh, talking with several uh, accounting firms, and they, they think that uh, uh, an even higher uh, filing limit would be advantageous based upon the amount of taxes or paperwork that they file that for no benefit because no taxes are due. Would that be considered? Uh, Representative, thanks again for the question. Uh, personally, uh, yes, I would be open to that consideration. Would of course um, want to consult with the department um, to determine the impact, but I think that's a possibility that would be entertained. Thank you, Senator Susie. Any further questions? Seeing none, then next signed up to speak in support is Greg Moore, the lobbyist from the American for Prosperity in New Hampshire. Greg Moore. Be there shortly. Hi there, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Excellent. Sorry, a little technical issues when they, when they jumped over to me. Uh, yes, uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to speak here today. My name is Greg Moore. I'm the state director with Americans for Prosperity here in New Hampshire, and we fully support Senate Bill 101. I believe it's good policy. As the fiscal note demonstrates, uh, over 86% of the businesses that filed that fell into this range had a tax liability of zero, meaning that uh, that's over 4,000 different uh, entities had to go and get their taxes prepared, but had no tax liability, which obviously creates a deadweight cost for each of those small businesses. And beyond that, as, uh, as uh, Senator Susie pointed out, this, uh, this uh, current limit of $50,000 has been in place since 1993. I did a, a check uh, and based on data from the Bureau of Labor Statistics, uh, the consumer price index has increased by 83%. So this 50% increase uh, is beneficial certainly, uh, and would certainly help a lot of small businesses as well as, as, well as reduce some of the administrative burden on, at the department level. Uh, it's, it still doesn't quite keep up with inflation. I think that, that uh, one prospect that we might ask the, the committee to consider is something similar to what we did in uh, House Bill 1418 back in 2012, where in addition to raising the threshold that we did for the BET, we also index it for inflation. So uh, I would ask the committee that we fully support the bill as it stands. Uh, we would fully support the bill at a higher level, uh, but we would think that maybe adding an, an, an inflation uh, index to it going forward, similar to what we did with, uh, with the BET would be a positive step. Uh, I will say that, that uh, this legislation was uh, as Senator Susie men mentioned, was initially filed back in 2018, and it was filed at the $100,000 level, 
not the not the seventy five thousand dollar level. And the Senate, upon passing it in a Senate Ways and Means, scaled it back from one hundred thousand to seventy five thousand. Uh, so maybe uh, if you get a chance to talk to one of your colleagues uh, over at the Senate Ways and Means who is serving in the last term, they might be able to offer you some ideas or guidance as to why they, they in fact, scaled it back from 100000 to 75000 So with that, I'd be happy to take any questions from the committee. Representative Yearly. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Mr. Moore. What was that uh, uh, bill that you uh, referenced with the uh, inflation index attached, please? Sure, it was House Bill 1418 from 2012, the 2012 session, uh, which uh, obviously <laughs> serving as the House Chief of Staff at the time, I was taking a keen interest in. Um, and that was a bill that uh, not only raised the limit for, raised the limit uh, on the BET for filing threshold, but also indexed it for inflation. Uh, th thank you, Mr. Moore. Any further questions of Mr. Moore or Representative Elmy? This is not a question because uh, I am a co-sponsor, but um, I thought I'd just like to testify briefly. Go ahead, Representative Elmy. Thank, thank you. Mr. Um, Chair, you have, uh, Alan may have a, are we dismissing the, the are we dismissing the, uh, uh, Mr. Moore, um, he's testifying as a new, as a new testifying person. Mr. Moore, I think Representative uh, Burstein has a question of the prior speaker. I do Representative Bernstein? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, good morning, Mr. Moore. Nice to see your name, at least, as not your face. Um, <laughs> anyway, you. I get that reaction a lot. <laughs> You had testified that over 86% of the businesses that filed within the range of 50,000 to 75,000 gross revenue had zero tax liability. Do you have numbers on if it if that threshold were increased to 100,000, uh, what percentage of businesses would still have a zero liability? I don't, I, I, I suspect what I would do is go back and look at the, the initial fiscal note uh, from the legislation that was introduced in 2018. I believe it was Senator Deitch who was the prime sponsor of that legislation. Uh, what I, I might refer you to go back and, and review maybe that fiscal note that might, off, might offer a, a substantial amount of guidance. A good idea. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any further questions for Mr. Moore? I don't see any, so Representative Elmy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> Uh, Representative Almy, uh, City of Lebanon. Um, I and you were in, in, and I think Representative Ullery were also on the committee in 12, 2012. And um, I wanted to talk about the indexing, which is something that I had suggested when that bill came through. Um, we had a situation where we'd had 100% inflation, I think, at that point, since the time that that one had been, been done. And um, there was a bill brought in to increase the threshold by that amount. And I thought, wow, that's a lot. And I went back and I, con I calculated it. There had been a lot more inflation that, that decade. And um, it was... Um, it was just it was just a little bit below a hundred percent at that point for um, since the BET threshold had been established and um, it did cost us a fair amount of money to do that at that point in the revenues so um, I suggested and everybody else thought it was a good idea that we index on that threshold so that we would not get sudden changes in our revenues due to, to changing the threshold as we went. And on, I was, I forget whether I was on the bill or not last, last term, but on, it did on, get considered in the Senate and I was following it. And they did, um, they did look at the number of people that would be 
exempted by changing it up to 100 and decide that 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 and the amount of money involved was too much for the budget at that point and um, take it down to 75. And I don't have the precise numbers here, but the DRA would have them and they could do a recalculation as well of, of how many people get exempted. I believe one of the problems is that um, if you exempt up to a high enough level, you encourage people to fudge, fudge their books. You don't catch the people that should be paying, but I'm not sure about that. Thanks. Any questions for Representative Elmy? Representative Major, there's a hand raised in the attendees. Uh, Henry Villou. I'm not sure if I pronounced it correctly. Hey. Uh, first of all, any, any questions for Representative Elmy? I don't see any, so we'll let Henry come in. Um, and he just lowered his hand, so never mind, I guess. Sorry. Anyone else wish to testify for or against Senate Bill 101? The sign up sheet that I have here, there's 16 that signed up in support, five and to oppose it, and one neutral. And I believe everybody has a copy of the Fiscal note quick guide says that the bill as is would cost the state of, uh, approximately one and a half million dollars. Does the DRA want to say anything? Carolyn just raised her hand. I'll promote her. Thank you. Carolyn, it's all yours. Do you have anything to say on Senate Bill 101? Or when people suggest that maybe you wrote 100,000 or use the indexing? Hi, Representatives. This is Carolyn Lear, Assistant Commissioner at the Department of Revenue. Um, I, we don't have any testimony to offer you today about this bill, um, but I'm happy to answer any questions Representative Major, as the screen was refreshing as I was promoted, I think I caught the end of your question, which was relative to whether we had a recommendation um, with respect to either the 100,000 or the indexing. Right. Uh, I, we certainly don't have a recommendation, but those are both um, changes that we could administer here at the department um, if you do desire to go either with a higher threshold or with indexing. Do you have any idea what the penalty would be going from 75 to 100 where it cost our revenue about one and a half million dollars at the 75,000 level? But it might be at the 100,000. So I, we don't have an updated analysis for that, but I do have in front of me the analysis that we did for Senator, um, then Senator Deach's bill in 2019, which used 2016 data. And we estimated the fiscal impact of going to 100,000 at um, about 2.2 million. Um, but we could certainly update that analysis um, with 2018 data so that you could compare it to the, uh, the fiscal note that you have for Senate Bill 101. I think that would be helpful. Sure. Any questions for the DRA, uh, Carol and Lear? Representative Tucker, you're muted, uh, Representative Tucker. Sorry. I wonder whether when you do the analysis of the difference between 75,000 and 100,000, you could choose a point in the middle, so that if there's some desire to compromise, we would know 
what the effect was of that compromise point. 85,000, 90,000. But I can just envision our, you really would have the number, but it wouldn't be available. While you're doing the analysis, could you come up with an in-between point and know the effect of that? We can do that. We'll, we'll do 85,000 unless Thank you, you very have much. an alternative. Okay, Representative G. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I was just wondering how difficult would it be to administer an indexed, you know, if we did go to an indexed situation, I'm, I'm thinking that, do you think it would cause a lot more errors on people that were potentially using last year's, um, you know, I know a lot of times when I, I use, I do my taxes, I look at last year's as kind of a guide, not that I trust every, I look to see what's changed, but I would imagine others do that as well. Do you, do you think that we'd have a lot more people making errors by not just having a set number as opposed to indexing? Thank you for the question, Representative. We already index the BET threshold every two years. Um, so I think to the, I don't think there would be any additional errors if we matched the BPT. Um, I don't have an answer for you as to whether the, the changing threshold for the BET every two years is currently causing errors. Although I suspect um, that given technology and the, um, the companies that produce electronically submitted returns that for the most part, it is um, automated for taxpayers, meaning they don't have to look it up at all. The, the form is programmed to have the correct threshold. Okay, thank you. Any further questions for Mrs. Lear? Yeah, right. Representative Bronney. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, uh, Ms. Lear. Uh, uh, thank you for reminding us that the index is every two years for the uh, BET. So if we were to do this, would it be easier for you to manage if we did the same, uh, instead of making it every year, make it every other year uh, in the same, in sync with the uh, BET? Uh, Melissa can jump in because she act if she would like to because she actually does the calculation um, if she disagrees. But I think the easiest thing for us would be to simply match the schedule that we currently have for the BET, which is updating every two years. We would simply do them both at the same time. Okay, thank you. Okay. I just promoted Melissa. Yes. Yeah, so Good morning, members of the committee, Melissa Rollins, Department of Revenue. Um, I was rejoining, so I didn't fully hear Carolyn's answer when I was um, being promoted. But I'm thinking I'm saying the exact same thing as her. I don't think it would be an issue. Um, I think it's much easier if we do do it in sync with the BPT, just because um, you're not changing thresholds on different years, you're changing them all at the same time. Um, probably easier for taxpayers and easier for us as well to make sure that those are in sync and updated at the same time every other year. Thank you, Melissa. Are you all set, Representative Bromley? I'm all set, thank you. Any further questions asked of the DRA? Seeing none. Does anybody else want to testify for or against Senate Bill 101? And no raise hands. And I'm closing the public hearing on Senate Bill 101. We'll take a quick five minute break before we go to the next public hearing on Senate Bill 3. So a five minute break.
Okay. I think we have just about everybody back. So is the recording started again? Uh, you, you're muted, Representative Gamal. I'm sorry. It doesn't, we don't stop it during oh, breaks. Okay. And I just promoted, I mean, uh, Senator Bradley. Okay, good. Then I'm going to open the public hearing on Senate Bill 3 FN an act clarifying the tax treatment of federal paycheck protection program loans. And the prime sponsor is Senator Bradley. Senator Bradley, it's yours to introduce the bill. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. Pleasure to be before you today. Um, for the record, Jeb Bradley from Wolfboro. The uh, Senate passed this bill uh, about a month ago on a bipartisan vote of 23 to zero with one member not participating due to a conflict of interest. The purpose of the bill is to clarify New Hampshire law and to make it consistent with federal statute that the payroll protection program was not deemed to be a taxable event. The federal government has adopted that policy that it's not a taxable event. And I believe, and the Senate concurs with that, that New Hampshire should not make this a taxable event either. Payroll protection was designed, and it did a good job, quite frankly, of keeping the economy afloat during the pandemic when our state and our nation faced significant economic uncertainty. Um, as you recall, New Hampshire's unemployment rate skyrocketed to above 15%. Thankfully, we are back at 3% now. And I think a large measure of that was the impact of the payroll protection program. Businesses could keep people on their payroll and not overburden our unemployment. But also it allowed the payment of mortgage interest. It kept loans performing. Rent was able to be paid by businesses, utilities. All of this helped prop up the economy. Let's remember, uh, Mr. Chairman, who did the payroll protection program primarily benefit? Well, it was targeted to companies of 500 and fewer employees. So the largest businesses around our country and in New Hampshire were never eligible. And they are some of the largest business profits tax taxpayers in terms of their overall business profits tax receipts. Senate Bill 3 does not affect them. And given the strong business tax revenue, I, I think that we would probably all agree that these companies, for the most part, seem to be performing fairly well. Um, our business tax revenue is significantly ahead in fiscal 21. I also think you can't just look at the businesses that the payroll protection program helped, you have to look at the thousands and thousands of jobs of hardworking men and women across our state who are better able to withstand the impact of the pandemic and the economic ravages. Congress has made it clear that the payroll protection plan was never intended, as I said before, to be taxable. And I think New Hampshire should also make it clear that the payroll protection program is meant to protect businesses and employees not to become the payroll taxation program in New Hampshire. The issue is we are tied to the 2018 IRS code, not the 2020 code. And so that's why the Department of Revenue has determined based on the fact that we are tied to the 2018 code that it is a taxable event. So that's why we need Senate Bill 3. We also have to look at what's happening around the rest of the country. There are 35 states that clearly do not tax the payroll protection plans. There are four other states that either don't allow it to begin with or it is mostly not taxed. And so there are 11 states, um, only in New England, Vermont, along with New Hampshire, has deemed that it's um, taxable. And I think 
it's vitally important, not only to protect the businesses that had to withstand the ravages of the pandemic, but also the message that it sends to businesses that are contemplating locating in New Hampshire, expanding in New Hampshire, staying in New Hampshire. We have done a lot over the last five or six years to make New Hampshire more competitive, lower workers' compensation rates, lower business taxation rates. We've tried to address, and I think we are making progress on things like affordable housing that make it possible to attract employees into New Hampshire. The last thing that we want to do is send a message in the live free or die state that while Washington has determined it's not a taxable event, that we, on the other hand, will make it a taxable event. So I believe that for all of the reasons above, that's why um, we had a 23 to zero vote, totally bipartisan, obviously, on quite frankly, what's a very big issue in the state of New Hampshire and one that could engender controversy, but senators came together across the spectrum to say, we need to make sure that we protect New Hampshire businesses. So thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Well, thank I you. would be uh, happy to answer any questions. Good. Um, first, it would be Representative Schamberg followed by Representative Schamberg. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Senator. Uh, Representative Schamberg here. Uh, I'm having just a little hard time understanding. If Senate Bill 3 passes, PP loans will not be included in the BP tax base. That I understand. So why should business expenses paid for with PP loans, loan amounts, remain deductible when they file taxes? Can you... Um I mean, business expenses is, have always been deductible. The fact is that when Congress authorized the Payroll Protection Plan as part of the CARES Act, it was never determined to be a taxable event in Washington. So because, as I explained, our code is tied to the 2018 IRS code, not the 2020 code, um, that's what makes it a taxable event. And And if we want to a hurt, you know, businesses with a very significant tax. And remember, it's the 500 or fewer employee businesses, not the largest businesses, but quite frankly, the main street businesses. Um, I think not only would we be hurting the um, lifeblood of the New Hampshire economy, but we'd also be sending a message that New Hampshire is undermining its competitiveness on a national scale. And as we're trying to recover from the pandemic, that's not a good, uh, good message to send to businesses in our state and around the country. Thank you. Representative Ames. You're muted, Representative. Okay, I'm, I'm, I, I got there, I got it unmuted. Um, Senator Bradley, good morning. And thank you for putting forward this much needed bill. Um, essentially, uh, I have an, a related question to the bill. It's closely related. Uh, it, essentially, this bill conforms New Hampshire's approach to the federal approach. The federal government has taken the lead on this. They've created a, the PPP loan program. And uh, as a part, and as, I'd say an integral part of that program, they've, uh, they've established the exempt uh, exemption for the forgiven loans and the expenses that go along with that. And uh, that's the way it is. For a, non, a state that doesn't conform automatically like New Hampshire, um, we're in a minority, I think, <clears throat> nationwide on that score. Uh, it requires an affirmative decision. And that's what SB3 is asking us to do. Um, <clears throat> the um, the question that I get to is whether, well, one other context point is that the cost of doing this seems to be rising almost as we speak through the estimating process. Um, the DRA estimate 
that came out, the revised fiscal note, has put it at $91 million, I think. Um, and I, I have questions, perhaps many of us do, about that estimate, but that's putting that aside, it's significant money. The uh, question that I get to is the grant money that's coming to us from the federal government through ARPA, which is sig significant, maybe $900 million or so. And there's a tax cuts provision in ARPA that um, is a limiting factor for states. If they cut taxes, then uh, pouring money, federal ARPA money in to fill the hole is something that in some way is forbidden. And what that way is, is being explored by Treasury as we speak. Um, but Treasury has just issued a guidance maybe two weeks ago that tells us that this provision is going to be different where a state uh, chooses to conform, this is my understanding, conform to the ARPA, not ARPA, the PPP approach to tax exemption. In other words, to update its IRC code, effectively cutting taxes for, at the state level for our firms that have received PPP loans, um, that that's okay. That doesn't trigger the tax cuts provision. And my question to you is whether you've uh, had, had occasion to look at this question and whether my understanding is correct essentially that if New Hampshire chooses to take some of that PP, that uh, ARPA money and steer it to fill the hole created, whatever that hole is created by conformity, um, that that would be okay to do. And it would be a choice that New Hampshire could make without worrying about being penalized for doing it. So let me just, um, thank you very much, uh, Representative Ames. Um, I would just say a couple of things. In looking at the fiscal estimate, it has changed um, a couple of times. The first fiscal note had a range of 80 million to 135 million. Um, a subsequent fiscal note, I believe, had a low range of 65 million. And now the most recent fiscal note um, discussed $90 million. So I think um, it is very difficult, um, as I'm sure DRA will testify to the exact um, you know, magnitude of what might happen if we pass Senate Bill 3. But let me just say again, it's a tax increase if we pass Senate Bill 3. And I, I, I judge from your question, you agree with that and agree with um, the fact that, um, you know, we should not be doing it. Now, I, I'm like you and I think everybody else um, in New Hampshire waiting for that final treasury guidance on the $1.9 trillion stimulus bill that the president recently signed and Congress enacted. Um, I, I think it's safe to say, and I, I'd take a, a, a slightly different approach. If we're the 40th state, at a minimum, to say we're not going to tax um, the payroll protection plan proceeds. I can't see any way that the federal government would trigger the provision that was put in the recent stimulus bill um, and, and override that. I think with 40 states, if New Hampshire becomes a 40th state, that debate is um, long over. In terms of uh, what the Treasury guidance will say, in, in terms of other, you know, taxation issues, I think we'll have to see what happens. Okay, follow up. Follow up with the names. And just really to essentially agree with Senator Bradley on this, um, I think that uh, that. By my reading of a statement put out by Treasury, they have jumped the gun on this particular provision, probably for the very reason that you've just set out, that some 30, 40 states have already 
uh, essentially conformed either automatically or by choice. And uh, it would make no sense to say, oops, you know, you're going to you're going to pay a penalty under uh, the ARPA money for doing that. It just doesn't make sense. And so they've, uh, I believe they've made it clear. Maybe somebody, uh, some people will disagree in their interpretation of that statement. But uh, so we're going down that road. And then there's the remaining question here in the state of what to do with that ARPA money. And, uh, and maybe it would be to fill, um, to use part of it to fill this hole. Um, I, and I'm open to that. I, I trust uh, you would be. Uh, yeah, obviously, I think, again, um, you know, businesses that have survived the pandemic, um, now's not the time to, you know, switch gears on them and say, the federal government has said it's not a taxable event, but in the live free or die state, we think it is. I think, um, you know, we need to make sure that we've done everything to help businesses get through this. And continue to get through it. I think Senate Bill Three does that, and I thank you for uh, your support of it. Representative Bonner. you're muted, Pat. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Senator Bradley. Um, so. Yes, the, the, the latest fiscal note is uh, 91.7 uh, million uh, from the DRA. But then we got some guidance this morning that because uh, 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 they, they said that uh, of the what's remaining in the second drawer, which was passed in December and ends on May 31st, uh, was 290 billion uh, potential loans. And I guess already 240 billion have already been awarded. So it only leaves 50 billion. So uh, that could be awarded. Uh, so that, that 91.7 midpoint, I would assume of the DRA's estimate wouldn't go up a bit, but not that much. So with that said, uh, and yes, as you mentioned, Senator, uh, that uh, we're all amazed at the revenues <laughs> that have come in so far this year uh, and uh, is it the, is your position and you being being majority leader that uh, even if even if this number was uh, call say 110 million or 120 million uh, that that's something that we can manage if we yeah. pass this bill? I, I mean yes it is and thank you for the question I think you know in looking at the first fiscal note the upper range of 135 million, we felt it was manageable then too. So um, what it ends up being, I think we're probably not gonna know for some time, but it's, I believe not only important, I think I keep stressing this, that um, we do everything possible to help, you know, the businesses that need the help in surviving the pandemic, but also, the statement that it makes in terms of New Hampshire being open for business and, and welcoming business. I think that's vital too. If, if we don't pass this, um, what opportunities are we going to lose as a state? I, I remain very concerned about that also. Okay. Thank you, Senator. Representative Spilsburg. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And thank you, Senator Bradley. Uh, it's obvious that you and the Senate have put a lot of effort into this and uh, I feel committed, but there, there is something that's really perplexing me. The PPP was structured as a loan program and it stipulated certain um, qualifying expenses that would allow for excusing the debt. So for it to be converted from a loan, um, you know, to essentially a grant uh, with the uh, debt excused, you had to use it for qualified expenses, at least 60% of which were payroll. And as, as you say, the real intended beneficiary was the employees. The country of Denmark, for example, did essentially the same thing, but bypassed local government and employers 
and just sent the money to the employees, same outcome. So here's what's confusing me. If all of the money received from PPP had to be offset by qualified deductions, why is there actually any business tax liability for those businesses to be concerned about? Or to put it a different way, isn't it really the case that these businesses would get a benefit from SB3 and conversely the state would take a hit in their tax revenues only to the extent that the exact same deductible expenses that were paid with PPP funds now are allowed to be used to offset revenues already or otherwise generated. Um, am I missing something? So <clears throat> I'm not a tax expert. I'm not an accountant. I'm not a lawyer. Um, so just understand that when I try to answer the question. My understanding of when the CARES Act passed and how it was structured is that payroll had to account, I believe it was for 70 or 75 percent of the eligible expenses. And it was limited to um, beyond that certain things like the payment of mortgage, utility, and rent. So it was a fairly limited amount of um, items that could be expensed by a business under a PPP loan. It did its job um, in the sense that our state, you know, shot, our unemployment rate shot up over 15%. It's back to 3% now. And um, businesses are having a hard time finding work at this point in time. So I think it, it did its job. And now it's, at least in my view, not the time to say, okay, you got through this, this grant helped you. And remember, you have to, in order to um, get it turned into a grant, it has to be signed off on by the banker that originated the PPP loan. So you have to have abided by, you know, the stipulations that I outlined previously, um, that turns it into a grant. I, it was never intended to be a taxable event in Washington for good reason. It was intended to keep the economy afloat. And I, I don't, I think New Hampshire should treat it the same way. It's, it, it should be a, um, treated as a grant, not a taxable event. Mr. Chairman, may I have a brief follow-up? Follow-up. Thank you. Uh, I understand your intention to provide the maximum amount of assistance to businesses who were placed in a difficult situation because of government decisions. Uh, but I just wonder if, it, if we can agree that effectively what we would be doing if we passed SB3 is we would be adding an additional form of assistance by relieving our businesses uh, to the tune of about another $91 million in taxes they would have owed on income otherwise earned. I guess I don't see it that way, Representative, because I think in most instances for those smaller businesses, 500 and fewer employees, they got payroll protection. It replaced revenue that they would have lost as a result of the pandemic. So I, I don't, the way I look at it, we're not giving an additional benefit. There's not a double counting here. Um, it kept businesses afloat. That was its intent and it performed. Now's not the time to backtrack and um, say, oh, by the way, um, Unlike the federal government, which has said it's a grant, if you abide by the conditions, we're going to make it a payroll taxation event. I, I just don't see it that way. Thank you, Senator. Representative Almey. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Senator Bradley, I, I've got uh, two questions here. One of them is the timing on this. Um, we got this guidance from the U.S. Treasury already, but it's sufficiently vague that some people, including DRA, are not sure 
that it means that we can use money from ARPA to pay for this. Um, while, while they're following that up, um, our, if it turns out that um, we are on our own for paying for this, is this going to be uh, something accounted for in the Senate budget, which it was not accounted for in the House because we did not have this bill yet? So it's a fairly substantial amount of money, any way they measure it. Yeah, my and I am not a member of the uh, Senate Finance Committee. My understanding is that um, it will be accounted for. Thank you. And could I add something else? We've been talking about on um, putting a preamble onto this that would, on um, assuming that the ARPA money is available, on um, point point out that on um, this. Um, would be able to be paid for from the, the, the federal funds, but uh, would, would be considered within uh, all the other things that the federal funds might be spent for by the state. Uh, the wording obviously is not very clear yet. Um, well, thank you very much, uh, Representative Almy. I would ask that um, if you're going to put a preamble on the you know, we work together and make sure that any changes to the language don't undermine the intent of the language. Um, as I said before, uh, and I think that, you know, if you, um, I'm trying to find where the map that somebody provided to me came from, but just looking at the map of the 39 states that right now do not tax the PPP loans, um, I see almost no way, having been in Washington before, that suddenly the new administration or Congress is going to reverse course on the PPP loans with, if New Hampshire joins in not taxing, it'll be 40 states. And there may well be some of the remaining 10 that are in the same process that we're at now in consideration Senate Bill 3. So I just don't see it as a threat that we need to um, worry about, given the vast majority of states already are not taxing it because of the way their tax structure works with conformity. Hello, Mr. Chair. Follow up. Oh, thank you. Um, yes, I, I understand we ought to, the committee ought to work together with you uh, about any wording if we do this. But the, um, the idea was if it is uh, refundable essentially by, by ARPA, um, that would take about a ninth out of the ARPA monies that we get. And uh, and I would hope that a lot of that is going to be going to broadband and roads and bridges and other things that are really important to the uh, future of our economy in this state. So it, it is a decision that we all are going to have to look at eventually in terms of how the ARPA money gets spent, assuming the legislature has a say in that this time. And... Um, uh, that was the reason we were thinking of a preamble, so everybody would have that in mind. Thank you. And I, I appreciate that again, and I guess that um, I would ask you to support my bill, Senate Bill 85, which creates a matching grant initiative um, for broadband expansion and obviously the ability to use some of that money. But again, let me, let me stress, it was never intended in New Hampshire, and it was certainly never intended federally to be a taxable event. This, this money um, propped up the economy and kept businesses and hardworking men and women afloat. It, it should not be treated as a taxable event. And, and again, you've got the impact that it would have on the current businesses in New Hampshire, but I think just as big as that is the message that it sends that, oh, 
we're now in the taxation um, raising business. And, and I think as we're trying to distinguish ourselves as a state that's open for business and we want to recover from the pandemic, that message would be very destructive. So the questions, if not, uh, I do have a question, Representative Bradley. The patient check protection program has helped out a lot of a lot of our businesses, and essentially, it says that if they used it for what it was intended for, then the loan is turned into a grant. And in addition to that, they can have a, they can deduct all the expenses. So they get a, a double benefit of this. Now, especially on the first part, uh, uh, the first stimulus, there are a number of companies that applied for this, but they weren't qualified. They were in desperate need of help, but they weren't qualified primarily on the first one because they started their businesses in 2019 and in 2020 they made more. So that automatically disqualified them. What would you do to help those businesses? Some of them had to go out of business and some of them had to mortgage their homes and everything else. What would you do to help those businesses that didn't qualify for the PPP that really needed it? Uh, well, thank you very much, um, Mr. Chairman, again, for your question. Again, um, the PPP for those businesses that got it, and remember, it was the smaller, up to 500 employees, um, the Main Street businesses, the backbone of you know, our state, it was to replace revenue loss from the pandemic. So in terms of you know, businesses that didn't qualify. And I apologize for having forgotten the number of the Senate passed bill, but it, it probably is in your committee, Mr. Chairman, where we on a going forward basis um, make any further um, similar programs from the feds eligible for those newer businesses. I think had we been writing uh, this payroll protection plan in the New Hampshire legislature, as opposed to the U.S. Congress, we probably would have um, thought of that. But, you know, we can't control what happened. And I will say that when Congress passed this, and again, having been there, um, it passed in warp speed in the end of in the end of March. And it is so rare that you have the bipartisan consensus that, you know, you had that passed the CARES Act um, a year ago. It, it was actually rather remarkable and it was very necessary and it wasn't perfect. Um, so I, I think the Senate has sent to you a bill that will impact um, positively, I think, newer businesses. And let's also remember that Governor Sununu established the Main Street program. Um, and I, I've forgotten exactly how much federal money of the CARES Act discretionary money that came to New Hampshire um, went into the Main Street program, but it was a lot of um, dollars. And I know that in my area, there were businesses that didn't get PPP that did get Main Street. And so I think that we've all um, tried to be responsive to, and will continue to be responsive to, you know, those businesses that uh, maybe didn't qualify initially for PPP. Senator, could you send me that information on that bill? Because I don't call the bill. Yeah, I believe uh, Representative Major was in one of the omnibus bills, but I will get you that. Okay, thank you. Any further questions for Senator Bright? Saying none, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The next one that signed up to talk in favor of the bill is David Gervais, 
lobbyist representing the Business and Industry Association. Uh, Dave? Just promoted him. He should be here shortly. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, for the record, my name is Dave Juve. I'm a senior vice president with the Business and Industry Association. Mr. Chair, could you ask staff to also authorize Steve Lawler, who is, who is in the uh, queue, to join me? Uh, Steve Lawler is a principal at Nathan Wexler here in town, and he's the chair of BIA's Fiscal Policy Committee. He's a CPA, and I'm going to rely on him to answer specific questions about how this would work, also the types of businesses that receive PPP loans, and uh, questions that um, uh, both the, the chair and, and Representative Ames brought up about um, what happens if this bill moves forward. Yes, can you? Yep, I did. He should thank be you. here. Uh, so let me go ahead and start out, uh, Mr. Chair, members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity. Again, my name is Dave Juve. I'm a senior vice president with the Business and Industry Association. We are very supportive of this bill. I thought Senator Bradley did a terrific job outlining the bill, why it's necessary, and what's going around on around the country relating to this issue. Uh, so I don't have a lot to add to that, although I'd be happy to respond to questions from the committee. Um, I would like to say that it is uh, BIA's analysis and also the analysis of Steve Lawler that that exemption uh, for states that are uh, coming into conformity with the latest IRS guidelines can use that new money from the American Recovery Act to supplement any revenue loss. Um, it's equally clear to us that other things that are written in the House passed version of the budget, like the reductions in the um, uh, business taxes and uh, other reductions in the rooms and meals tax and so on, would likely not qualify. But because this bill brings New Hampshire into conformity with the most recent IRS guidelines. It's our analysis uh, that it would qualify, but obviously um, we're all waiting for clarification from the Treasury Department. Um, Mr. Chair, I'll end my testimony there, but I would like to turn it over to Steve Lawler now for some additional comments, and then we're happy to answer any questions. Okay, Mr. Lawler, you have the floor. Thank you, Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'd like to just clarify a few things. Um, there were a number of businesses that did get the, the payroll protection uh, loan money. Um, they did use it for payroll. They kept people on. Um, they kept their businesses open where they may have closed. Um, they used that money to pay the people that didn't have to go on unemployment. Um, they limped along and they got to um, the end of the year. They may have broke even between what they were able to for revenue and what they had for expenses, which would include that payroll. But there isn't a lot of money left over to pay the business profit tax if they had to do that. And I think that's where the federal government, when they initially uh, institute the CARES Act and also um, that they realized that businesses, this money was a lifeline for businesses and to have them pay tax on that at the end of the day would have been a burden because then they didn't have it, then they may have a closed shop and they may have to have people to um, go on unemployment. So um, not all businesses, but there was a number of businesses that, and at the time, very, very because good. they- now, um, Construction workers, what needs to be done to protect the health and- The model, could you? Okay. okay sorry. So I just want to make people aware of that, um, not necessarily was a windfall, but there was, you know, people kept their businesses alive, they kept their people employed, and now they actually have to pay a tax on that, you know, could be a significant burden. Thank you. Okay, thank you for your testimony. Questions from the committee? Representative Ames, followed by Representative Schoenberg. Yeah, thank you, uh, Mr. Lawler. Um, my question is, uh, is what uh, you mentioned, you mentioned uh, businesses coming to the end of the year and, and they've scraped by and PPP has been a, very helpful. Um, I'm wondering about uh, uh, 
whether they've been paying the state tax. Uh, DRA has been quite clear that our situation until SB3 or something changes it applies to a forgiven loan. And um, so uh, have, in your experience, to your knowledge, have uh, firms been paying uh, either by estimate or by uh, return uh, tax on these uh, forgiven loan proceeds? Or is it too early to know? Or can you speak to that? A um, couple things. Uh, one is um, you only get taxed upon the forgiveness. And um, there was a number of companies that haven't gotten their forgiveness yet. So that would be a 2021 issue. Um, I think not what I've seen is that uh, it was not worked into estimated tax formulas um, with the hope that it would be uh, not taxable at the state. Thank you. Uh, so just follow up. Well, just, just to be clear. So, so in your experience, uh, based on what you've seen, what you know, um, the, uh, the, the increase in revenues that we uh, are harvesting in New Hampshire, uh, that's one word that seems almost applicable since the revenues are so high, um, isn't, uh, hasn't been affected by uh, payments of this uh, state level tax that uh, firms expect will be refunded later on or whatever, you know, this, this is not related. Can you speak to that? Um, it, it, the only reason I could speak to it is I think it, it gave a lifeline to a lot of businesses, which ended up doing better, but they would have never been able to stay open if they weren't able to get this lifeline. Thank you. Representative, Representative Schamberg, uh, I thought you were in there. Go ahead, Representative. Yes, thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, is Mr. Uh, Duve still on the line? I am. Thank you. Uh, I, my question has to deal with uh, the state has priorities, as, do, as does other organizations in New Hampshire. If expenses paid for with PP loans uh, or amounts remain deductible, which means a reduction, which would mean a reduction in taxable revenue for the state from normal times. What happens to the priorities of uh, supporting adequate funding to healthcare providers for Medicaid and other publicly supported healthcare programs? And what happens to the priority of supporting net metering policies that do not result in cost shifting? And the last part is what happens to these priorities for adequate investment in New Hampshire's road and bridges if, uh, uh, if, we're, if we're allowing the PP loans to be also deductible? Well, I'll start on that, but I might want to turn it over to Steve Lawler. So okay. I, I don't know that the net metering issue um, which is primarily on, on the tariff that's paid to customers who are engaged in net metering has anything to do with this or state revenues. And um, to a great extent, uh, the highway program, it relies on the uh, highway user taxes paid into the state's highway fund, which again, is not impacted by this legislation. Uh, you know, one way the state can um, pay for uh, priorities is, is through the uh, vast increase in, in business tax collections far beyond what was expected. And, and I think we can all agree that the economy, even though we're still you know hampered by the pandemic, the economy seems to be getting stronger. At least that's what we're hearing from our members who have many open positions that they can't even find people to fill. So there's every indication that the economy is going to continue to get stronger, not weaker. Now, in terms of, I think the specific of your question relating to the deductibility of, of business expenses, I, I am hoping Steve Lawler can address that better than I could. Um, my understanding of the representative's question was that if the money wasn't there, 
how would you prioritize other um, state needs? Was that your question, Representative? Uh, a, in a way, I, I just we're not we're not counting this revenue. We're not double counting this revenue, but we seem to be taking a, and a deductible of applying this money, this PP loans as deductible expenses that weren't even counted in the beginning. I understand what the policy is. I, I'm just trying to figure out how much money we're maybe going to lose on this. Well, if I could, if, if we're right in our analysis, um, representative, and yes. the state is able to use that new income coming to the state from the um, American Recovery Act to supplement any loss, uh, that results from bringing the state into compliance with newer IRS guidelines, there is no revenue loss. Okay, thank you, sir. Are you all set, Representative Schamberg? Yes, I am, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Representative Elmy. Thank you. Um, I had three questions. One of them is how many New Hampshire businesses have more than 500 employees? I've always thought that that was very few. It's a large business in New Hampshire. It's a very large business in New Hampshire at 500. It's a small business, medium business apparently elsewhere. <laughs> yeah, Representative Almi, I'm sorry, I don't have access to that information. I'm not sure if someone from DRA could respond to that or if you could check with business and economic I, affairs. I do agree yeah. with you in the grand scheme of things throughout the country, 500 employees would not be considered a large business, but here in New Hampshire, the scale is different. We do yes. have the DRA when we testify later. Yeah, and we could check, I don't know if employment security could tell us also, um, but the second one is probably something that, that you haven't worked on either, which is how many of these businesses are part of Water's Edge filings. Uh, that is, they are subsidiaries or, or subcontract. I'm, I haven't figured out yet whether uh, subcontractors sometimes are considered subsidiaries in Water's Edge in DRA. And that may be a question for for the DRA. But yeah, again, it, we, we don't have access, the BIA doesn't have access to information about who filed for a, for a PPP loan and, and of those which had the loans forgiven. So again, I wouldn't be able to answer that question. And well, I don't know if you can answer this one, but you <laughs> may have better ideas than, than anybody else we could ask. Uh, we we got access to a spreadsheet, which is maintained supposedly uh, for the federal government about how many, uh, which PPP loans are in each town in the state. Um, and almost all of the ones that I checked in my town of city of Lebanon are uh, not forgiven yet. So um, is it true generally across the state? I see Mr. Lalor nodding his head, that on um, the forgive, forgiving process is just starting? Because I'd understood it was going pretty fast. Yeah, yeah Representative, um, when they passed uh, the next, uh, I think it was the, the act that right at the end of December, a lot of the banks were scrambling to get new PPP loans out. And uh, a lot of the banks put on the forgiveness process on hold. Uh, I was looking at a bank this morning that is only going to be accepting applications for forgiveness up to 150,000 over 2 million. So all those loans that were for, that were given in between that cannot apply yet. Um, so uh, I think that's where the, the are ready to, to apply. I think it's just, there's just been some slowness in uh, the application process. Um, Representative Spilsbury. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, this is for either uh, Mr. Juve or Mr. Lawler. Um, and and it, it gets uh, pretty much to the question that I was asking Senator Bradley. 
Uh, but essentially, HB3 seems to be motivated by a concern that we should not have businesses who were receiving a lifeline exposed to incremental tax liability for the funds that the government uh, provided them. But if they managed to, or do manage to have that loan excused, it's only because they did with the funds exactly what was intended. And that is used them primarily for payroll expense and for other qualified uh, expenses, all of which are deductible expenses. So if every dollar of PPP, which has been excused, was excused exclusively because it was offset by a dollar of qualified expenses, how can there be any incremental exposure to business profits tax? Is the presumed harm actually an illusion? I'll let Steve Lawler address that question. Yeah, we did, Steve and I did chat about that issue yesterday. So, uh, Steve? Well, I mean, it, it comes to the point is, um, as I talked in the beginning of my testimony, there are businesses out there that, yes, they did use it for um, payroll um, and they used it as a lifeline to keep their doors open. Um, now the cash isn't there for them to pay the business profit tax on that additional revenue that the PPP forgiveness would, um, would cause um, because they used all that money. They would have closed their doors and they would have not had the people on payroll. Think of a restaurant that was closed, but they got the PPP money and kept paying their people and then they may reopen again. Um, they made a little profit before the end of the year. So now maybe they broke even um, because of their expenses versus a little bit of profit that they could make because they were only open for a short period of time. And now, and they got the PPP money to help them get through that. Um, and they pretty much broke even, but now there's no money left in order to pay the tax. So brief follow through, please. Follow up. Just tracking what you said, this is the way I interpret it. They consumed all of the PPP funds for qualified expenses, thus exhausting the cash flow that was incrementally available to them, meaning they don't have any cash to pay um, tax liabilities. But there are no tax liabilities associated with that amount of PPP funds because they were entirely offset by deductions. So the only tax liability would be from business as usual. Am I? It, right, but there may not have been business as usual if they weren't able to keep their doors open. There either were profits that are taxable or there were no, ta no profits that are taxable. They, yeah, because they were able to keep their doors open, they were to work, they made a little bit of money, but they broke even from a revenue standpoint and expense standpoint. And now if you add that additional uh, income from the PPP loan forgiveness, there isn't the funds there to pay for it. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, next would be Representative Brondy. Sure, uh, this question will be for Mr. Lawler. Uh, I'm just following up on uh, Representative Ames's um, question. I, I, I guess what we're interested in, in a little bit more on is we're, we're ahead as of yesterday, 71 million in business taxes revenues, which I've been on Ways and Means for 11 years. We've never seen a month like this. Uh, so we're suspecting that it may have something to do with all of what we're discussing here. But you, but, but Ms. Law, you said that not really, um, maybe some of it, but uh, because of this, the new interesting comment you made was upon forgiveness that, that this event doesn't happen until the loan is actually forgiven, which is very helpful to, to uh, that was, that I wasn't aware of that. <clears throat> so, so when we look at taxable year 20 and taxable year 21, wh what you're saying is that there really weren't that many loans forgiven in, in, in 20? Is, uh, can you add, add a little more light to any knowledge about what percentage of the loans were 
were forgiven in 20 versus that are still being forgiven 21 uh, that will be forgiven in 21. See, that'll help us try to understand this whole, is this some of this due to uh, people paying their taxes uh, without this bill being passed to, to comply with current statute and that expecting a refund later on if the bill passes. I can't give you a percentage of how many were forgiven before the end of 2020 and the end of 21. I can only give you what my experience is and what I've seen through my client base. Um, we, do, we did have a number of people that had their loans forgiven before the end of 2020. Um, what has happened with those businesses is they're, they are realized that there is a bill that is working its way through um, that was passed in the, the Senate and is working its way through the House. Um, and what they have done is extended their returns, in essence, in order to see what the outcome was um, and either paid, paid based on current law or is waiting to see what the, the outcome will be and, and pay their taxes at that particular time. Okay, uh, thank you. That's, uh, that's helpful. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Uh, any further questions of um, uh, Mr. Gervais or Mr. Lala? I, I, I do have one comment that is over the weekend I talked to a, an accountant and he asked, what are we doing with the Senate Bill 3? And I said, we're working on it. And he says, good. He says, because he had a lot of customers who, who have been uh, paying the tax because they're using current law. And if this passes as is, then they're going to be asking for refunds right away. And so what we need to understand is this windfall of taxes that we're getting from the BPT right now, the business taxes, how much of that is associated with paying the tax on the BPPT, on, on the PPP loans? And then if um, Senate Bill 3 passes as it is, then that will turn the thing around that we, and as he said, there's be a lot of requests for refunds or reduced CCOs. So I, from what I've heard today, we don't know what that is, but we need to ask the DRA that. Any further questions for, represent, uh, for Mr. Gervais or Mr. Lala? And then thank you for your testimony. Thank, Thank you, you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. We appreciate the opportunity. Thanks again. Thank you. I have one more person signed up to testify in support of the bill. It's uh, Mike Summers. I do not see a Mike Summers in the attendees, oh. um, but there are three other people with their hands raised. Uh, Christy Merrill is first. Okay. And are they all in the attendees? All in attendees, yep. Go ahead, bring Christy Merrill. Merrill. Good morning. My name is Christy Merrill. I'm president of the New Hampshire Bankers Association. Um, we are monitoring this legislation. We don't have an official position. Um, I did want to just offer to help with any questions. And I did want to try to specifically address a couple of questions that came up. Um, both Representative Almi and I believe Representative Abrami asked questions about forgiveness. Um, I did just want to add that um, the forgiveness process has started. Uh, there was a delay. Um, I know that the SBA was trying to work through. And so um, they had um, a deadline of 90 days. The SBA had a deadline of 90 days to issue their decision on forgiveness once a bank processed that. There were many loans that were sort of held over past that 90 day mark. And the banks were looking for guidance as in terms of when that forgiveness might happen and how that might come. Um, to my knowledge, as of this date, 
that has not yet been resolved. Um, and that was that was not uh, that was sort of the exception by and large with forgiveness was happening on a fairly rapid basis. And I, that's I haven't heard anything contrary to that with this most second round with this uh, most recent round of PPP funding. Um, and then Representative Abrami, I know that you asked the question of the percentage of forgiveness um, versus not forgiveness in the various rounds. I don't have those percentages for you, um, but what I can tell you is that it was the majority or the overwhelming majority of loans that were forgiven. Um, and certainly banks were working with their, their customers to try to get them so that way their loans could be forgiven and would try to recommend and working with the business owner how they use it so that way that it could try to be forgiven um, and you know the only other comment that i would make in terms of the forgiveness and and what the intent was behind congress um, it is our view that it was intended to to really be a grant and i think the fact that congress came back and they expanded what uh, what qualified as an eligible expense the fact that that was expanded um, is consistent with our sort of interpretation that Congress really designed this to be a grant um, in the case that others couldn't use it for those eligible expenses, then it is a loan. Um, and my understanding is that that is, that is really, um, as I said, I don't have percentages, but that's really the minority of um, the PPP applications that were approved. Well, thank you for your testimony. You take questions. Ms. Merrill, will you take a, take questions? I will, gladly, I'm sorry. Okay, Representative Bromley followed by Representative Elmy. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Ms. Merrill, for taking my question. Um, so I just wanna make sure I understand now, when did, when did the forgiveness begin? Um, it, it began fairly soon after the first round. I mean, the, the program started over a year ago, so um, the forgiveness process started, I forget now, and there have been so many changes in guidances, but um, relatively quickly. Uh, there was a little bit of delay in the process in terms of how that was going to happen and everything, but um, I mean, I, I want to say within the first couple of months. Okay, so follow up, Mr. Chair. Follow up. So, uh, so you're, uh, make sure I understood what you said. It sounded like you feel that a lot of the forgiveness has happened. I do. I, I do with respect to round one. As I said, many banks were concerned. There were, there were loans um, in there that they held that were not yet forgiven, that were past that 90 days. And the rules said that the SBA had 90 days. And so they, they're anxious to get those um, forgiven. But that was the, the exception rather than the rule. Uh, let, uh, no, second follow-up, Mr. Chair. Follow-up. Uh, Ms. Merrill, so... Uh, so the round two, the, the second draw uh, was another 290 billion. Is that correct? Something like that? I believe so. I don't have those total numbers right in front of yeah, me, but I believe so. 290 yes. billion. So, uh, but, but, so uh, there's still May 31st is, the, is, it's my understanding from DRA that there's still 50 billion remaining in that, that, and so, so I guess additional loans are still gonna be coming. Uh, do you have any information on that? Yes, I do. Let me just grab my notes if I can. Okay, as of earlier this week, there is 30 billion left in the program. And so they expect that that will run out to the pri to the program's end. And you probably know this, but as a reminder, the program ends on May 31, but there's an additional 30 days beyond that to process applications that are pending. And again, uh, one more follow-up, Mr. Chair. All of, so all of... Yes. All of that uh, second draw, which because it, it was it passed in December, rarely is going to affect twenty-one taxes. Is that correct? I'm sorry, I, I did not catch the last part of what you said. <clears throat> so since that since that law was passed at the end of December, everything we're talking about in the second draw really was affects uh, twenty-one fiscal or uh, taxable year twenty-one. Is that correct? I believe so, but I would just say that I do not profess to be a tax expert and, and could be wrong on my tax years. Okay, we'll, we'll, we'll talk to DRA about that. Thank you. Okay, before I go to Representative Alamy, you keep hearing about the first and the second uh, PPP loan program. The first one 
went from April of 2020 to August 31st of 2020. The second one, which we're in now, started 1121. It goes to May 31st, 21. So there's probably an, almost another five weeks left for people to apply. And then uh, looks like Christy Merrill just said that there's about $30 billion left there of the total. Okay, uh, Representative Elmy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Ms. Merrill, there on, um, we found a website called federalpay.com, uh, which Representative, I believe you're on mute. Uh, I can't bring these things up and stay unmuted at the same time, federal, federalpay.org, which um, says that is linked from the Small Business Administration and says that it is responsible for reporting all of these loans. And that's the one I was talking about earlier where um, I was looking through uh, the zip code, which is most of Lebanon, and um, recognized a fair number of the people and the businesses sometimes only by, by a certain amount of thought. Um, and um, almost all of them were reported as uh, neither repaid nor forgiven yet. And I'm wondering if there is another site somewhere or organization that we could could ask that would tell us how many um, how many loans have already been forgiven in New Hampshire or even nationally, um, because it looks like that website must be seriously out of date. It also had a lot of inaccuracies in it. But thanks. Uh, Representative, I'm not familiar with the website. Um, I will tell you that we, we do try to track the data here in New Hampshire, New Hampshire pretty closely. Um, we represent 38 members, uh, th 38 member banks, New Hampshire chartered, out of state chartered, as well as nationally chartered banks. And of those 37 participated in the PPP, the one bank that did not participate um, does not offer commercial lending. So that's why they didn't participate. Um, so to answer your question, I've, not, I've never seen that number reported. I'm not saying that it's not available, but um, we do try to track this closely. I've never seen the number reported as to the number of loans forgiven. Um, the sba.gov website, I, I believe it's sba. or slash ppp.gov. Um, I apologize, something along those lines. They do publish all their data. They, I think they release that every Monday or every Tuesday, and that gives you a running tally of what's left. Um, it also gives a breakdown by state, but I've not seen the number of forgiveness. So that really is the best I would just say to give to go to the SBA in New Hampshire to try to answer that question. If they can give it out, they would have it. Um, and similar, the, the first program, you're right that um, they did release everyone, every company that got, got a loan um, after the first round was completed, you can find that by state. And so we did sort of collect that data, look at that at New Hampshire. Um, I think they, they gave a range between two and 10 million. Um, they didn't give the exact loan amount. So I suspect once this, this second round closes, we'll see another uh, release of data. I would expect that to be consistent. I don't know that. Um, but I would expect some additional information. But to my knowledge, I have not seen the forgiveness. The one thing that I might be able to do is survey our members. Um, but you know, the the banks are all very busy right now, and so I try to be selective and and what information I try to get from them. Are you all set, Representative Almi? You're, uh, you're muted. Are you all set, Representative Almi? On um, yeah, uh, yes. I think we need to contact SBA New Hampshire. Okay. I don't know how we do that, but <laughs> thank you, uh, Representative Spilsberg. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Ms. Merrill, I'd, I'd like you to just confirm that I've got an understanding correctly as a prelude to a question I want to pose. 
So am I correct in understanding that the PPP essentially deputized the banks who are members of your association to manage the funds and uh, determine uh, a qualification to receive PPP. And now their follow-up role is to certify that the funds were used appropriately uh, before qualifying them for the uh, forgiveness. Is that correct? Ba basically the banks are reviewing the expenses and the use of the funds in order to certify that they qualify for forgiveness? Um, Representative, in terms of the final forgiveness, my understanding is that that final decision is made by the SBA in terms of what is a qualified expense. Um, when a bank is working with a customer, they might walk them through to help them understand what the eligible expenses are and sort of make suggestions to them basically in terms of how to get those loans forgiven. But um, ultimately, that final decision is made by the SBA in terms of forgiveness. Okay, thank you. So here's my question. Uh, if an amendment were prepared to SB3, that essentially stated any qualifying expenses that were uh, deployed against PPP in order to obtain debt forgiveness cannot then be used as deductions from income uh, that would uh, otherwise uh, go into the BPT calculation. Um, what would your reaction to that amendment be? Or do you think that amendment would essentially counter the purpose of HB3? Well, if I'm understanding your question, um, so it, it, as I, it sounds like the root of your question is that you're concerned that a small business owner may be granted forgiveness based on eligible expenses, but also getting an additional tax benefit? Is that a correct Essentially understanding? Essentially using it in two ways to get a double deduction. Would, um, would an amendment that precluded them from using the same expense twice, um, how would you view that? Um, well, you know, as I as I said in, in the beginning, we don't officially have a position. Obviously, we have an interest in knowing the outcome um, as our members are processing a lot of these applications. But I, I guess what I would say, and I don't know if it's of, of help to you or not, but I think what they're, the banks are finding is that when um, a small business owner puts in an application, and obviously, you know, everyone would, want, would love to see 100% forgiveness. Um, there's some type of combination. It's not either entirely forgiven or, or not. It's, it's really a combination. So they, they might be able to use, you know, 40, 40 to 60% on qualifying expenses, but there's a, there's a remaining balance there. So, um, I, you know, I, I wouldn't take a position on that. That's all I, I guess I can say. And um, I apologize if that's not really helpful for you. Oh, I, actually, that's very helpful. So in other words, an amendment of that sort might have to be worded to the extent that uh, expenses resulted in a complete or partial um, forgiveness, dot, dot, dot. Uh, I thank you. I think it's very helpful. Further questions uh, for Mrs. Merrill? Uh, hold on a second. There is a name. Thank you, uh, Mrs. Merrill. Representative Major, I can um, send along uh, contact information for the New Hampshire SBA office if that would be helpful to you all. It would be super. Thank you. Uh, but we do have Mike Summers in the attendees. So if you could let Mike Summers in. Done. Mike Summers has signed up as a lobbyist with the New Hampshire Lodging and Restaurant Association and support. And Mike Summers, go ahead. Uh, good morning, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. I apologize for uh, missing my uh, point in line. We have multiple hearings going on. I was juggling things, and so I, I apologize um, and, and appreciate you taking the time to allow me to, uh, to follow up with you. But um, for the record, Mike Summers, I'm the President and CEO of the New Hampshire Lodging and Restaurant Association. 
as I'm sure you're aware, our industry has been very hard hit by this uh, pandemic as we try to come out of it. Uh, I testified before this committee, uh, I believe it was a couple of months ago now, kind of tried to give an overview of, of where we had come from and what we had hoped for the future. Um, but I, I guess I'm here to ask today that, um, first of all, that you support, support SB3. I think uh, tax exemption of PPP is, is the least we should be doing for these small businesses who are struggling. I, I will tell you, I continue to get phone calls from restaurateurs specifically, but many hotels as well, that are legitimately hanging on by their fingernails. And frankly, their, their lot probably isn't going to improve anytime before July 4th weekend. Um, so I, you know, I just, I ask you to be sensitive and I appreciate the fact that, you know, you have a very difficult job trying to figure out how we're going to fund the state for the next biennium. I, I get that. Um, but I, but I think what, what I'd like to ask of you is to also consider, uh, potentially, uh, exempting the, uh, the CARES Act funds, the P, the, uh, Main Street Relief Funds and others to also be included. I don't know if it can be done specifically for our industry. I suspect not, but we're certainly requesting that because there are many businesses right now that are in, in dire straits and as uh, has been mentioned a number of times in this discussion today, we have um, the purposes of these funds was to keep our employees at work and, and off the unemployment rolls and, and, and keep kept in place. And, and so that to, to the uh, couple of the points that I believe Senator Bradley made, it, it was successful in that effect. And it seems, uh, I will just say that from many industry folks that I've spoken to, it is very frustrating that they have fought and, and scrabbled to get to this point to then have the state potentially step in and ask them for a portion of whatever aid they received in order to prop up their businesses. Um, and, and for those of you who have restaurant uh, business owners as friends, I think you can appreciate that uh, they're a pretty independent lot. They don't like to ask for aid or assistance, but this was the year they needed it. So um, that is my appeal to you. And uh, with that, I will close and I'd be happy to try to answer any questions you may have. Well, thank you for your testimony, uh, Mr. Summers. I, I do have a question. Is how many in your organization uh, have contacted you because they weren't allowed or qualified to get these PPP loans? So there were some. Uh, for the most part, they were larger businesses. Um, and again, you know, you, you would anticipate larger businesses had, had a little more equity, a little more wherewithal. Uh, but there were some groups that certainly did not qualify. Surprisingly, it was more on the lodging side, the hotel side, where folks did not qualify for a variety of reasons. And so uh, there definitely were... Uh, I'd be hard pressed to give you a, a percentage or a number uh, representative, but, but there were a fair number of businesses that did not qualify. What I will also add as, as a qualifier is, you know, when it came to the Main Street Relief, there were even more folks that didn't qualify for a variety of reasons and, and how those uh, programs were structured as well. And so as we look at this, there are a fair number of businesses that, uh, again, when I say they're hanging on by their fingernails, I don't think that I'm really understating their position. Well, thank you, uh, Representative Bronny. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Mr. Summers. Um, can we just focus on the Main Street program a second? Um, I, how is that structured? Uh, uh, is it is it were they grants to the businesses? Was it similar to PPP? Or can you help us out with that? I, I know I don't. I can't remember how that was structured. And, yeah, and and I, forgive forgive me. My understanding is probably cursory because I wasn't actually didn't go through the process, but. Ultimately, the way this worked, it was, it was a pass through from uh, the federal CARES Act monies came into the state and then the governor uh, and the gopher committee uh, decided how to distribute those funds. But ultimately, that, that money came through and was distributed to businesses uh, based on a, on a need basis. Um, and it was given uh, as, as, as uh, uh, forgivable grants. But a couple of caveats. So the first is, uh, the grants maxed out at $350,000. And frankly, there were a lot of people that got much, much less than that. Um, but then there is also, we've just gone through a true up process where um, there was a calculation that was required to be done and re reporting uh, to DRA where they had to take their 2019 sales, deduct their 2020 sales, deduct um, uh, PPP and whatever that difference was, uh, you know, deduct Main Street from that. And then if, there, if you were in the, in the black, then that money will likely have to be returned to the, to the state. Um, but there are an awful lot of businesses that were still in the red at the end of those calculations. So 
Um, I think to, to, to the crux of your question, Representative, I think uh, there was simply a pass-through grant from CARES Act money through the state to the businesses. But, but Mr. Follow up, Mr. Chair. Follow up. But as I again, you, you wanted to roll this into this bill, so so is that that grant taxable at the moment? Yes. Okay, that's what I was so trying to get. Would at. Consider an income of the business, and again, I, I did follow up with DRA to confirm that. But yes, the grant monies uh, will will be treated as income of the business, and you know. I'll go a step further. We now have a third round of, of aid that are going to businesses, which is the Restaurant Revitalization Fund, which you may have heard of as part of their most recent package. And those grants uh, was just announced today that that grant portal will open on May 3rd. So there is going to be another round of grant funding that will go specifically uh, primarily to restaurants. And so, again, that's going to be another tax liability potentially for these businesses as, as we get into next year. But is the follow up again? Follow up. Is it the grant that's taxes, or is it really after the grant? Is it the uh, if they still not profitable, will there be be there won't be business taxes? Correct. That, that was my assumption. Yes. Yeah, right. we'll, we'll follow up with the DRA. We'll, we'll, we'll follow up with the DRA. I'm sorry. Yes. Thank you. Uh, further questions of Mr. Sanders? Uh, seeing none. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you, sir. Appreciate your time. Uh, we have one more, Janine. Yes. Uh, Michael Benton, the letterman. Yep. Thank you. Uh, unfortunately, I was unable to uh, register in time for today's meeting, and I thank you for the moment. Uh, I am a business owner uh, and significantly benefited from PPP. Uh, I employ about 250 people in the state and have gone through the process. I'd like to just make one thing um, obvious that, that PPP did more than provide the lost revenue. It provided my business with the ability to stay afloat because the, it wasn't just the lost revenue, it was the lost profits. I was shut down for four months. Without those funds, I would have gone out of business all the employees. I was able to maintain not just my employees, but I was also able to maintain the future of my business. And if you say that we mix accounting uh, with the fact that I'm taking an expense against money that was granted to me to stay alive, uh, we're mixing, we're confusing the point. The point is, it's not an accounting issue. It truly was money that was needed from the federal government to keep my business alive. And to, and, to, and to mix that with, I will be able to take a deduction confuses the situation because quite honestly, the money that was, was given to me, not only was given to me to stay alive, it's also been given to me to allow as consumer confidence in my business grows. And, and as we exit this pandemic, I've lost even more revenue that, that, that I require for the, for, my, for the future of my business. So I'm speaking on behalf of a, a businessman in the state who is, is gone through this process very painfully. None of us asked for this. And the PPP funds were critical. And as, as I believe the accountant stated, at the end of the day, you don't have the money to pay tax on top of the money that you received to stay alive. So if I can answer any questions relative, I have gone, I have just filed for forgiveness, the process with my bank, uh, was very confusing, uh, but we, we have gotten through that. We, we weren't even allowed to apply until the beginning of March of this year through my banking and lending institution. We did apply. The bank went through that process. As I exited that process, the bank basically sanitized all of my forgiveness. 100% of the PPP funds I received went to payroll. There were no other expenses. It 100% went to payroll. And then from that point, it now goes to the SBA. I'm still not forgiven. I've only gotten through the bank process. Now the SBA has 90 days. I have 10 months from the time I was funded to actually apply. So I was kind of gated by the bank, but we're, we've met those guidelines. So hopefully I will receive forgiveness from the SBA and my loan will then turn to a grant. If that doesn't happen, then starting September, I will then be 
uh, my loan will have to start to be repaid. So I'm hoping very much that the, that the loan will be forgiven by the SBA. Well, thank you for your testimony, Mr. Benton. Questions from Mr. Benton, uh, Representative Elmy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Benton, on um, which, what sector are you in? I'm in the health and fitness industry, ma'am. Health and fitness, thank you very much. And on, um, you were in round one? Yes, ma'am. And they wouldn't, you weren't allowed to apply for, give, for forgiveness until March, so. The, the websites but, were not available. Uh, and then when the second round hit, the banks uh, were, there was a lot of confusion with, a, with, a, with my particular bank. And I don't believe I'm, uh, I'm uh, an exception to this. Uh, so that we weren't really allowed or in a position to actually use their website to start the forgiveness process. Representative Allen. Thank you. That's, that's really helpful to know. And I'm sorry for, for what you're going through. It, the, the thing that I'd like to point out is the consumer confidence, at least in my sector, and I think that's true for the hospitality and restaurant sector, is still not there. Probably 30% of my business is gone. Now I'm hoping to get that back. And, and that's going to be a process over time. So these funds, like I said, were not just for the immediate to cover my, they're for my future. Uh, so it, to pay tax on top of what we received will be a huge burden a year from now. Other questions of Mr. Benton? Uh, Representative Spilsbury. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, just a brief question, Mr. Benton. Uh, I'm certain that you've been through a struggle and I appreciate it and I applaud you. If 100% of your PPP loans were used for payroll, why do you fear any exposure to tax on those funds? Well, then it, the payroll is an expense. So if you yeah. take the opinion that it's, it's irrelevant whether I used it for rent or used it for payroll, I was able to deduct it. And, but I didn't look at the accounting process of being able to deduct something from the federal government that was given as, a, as aid to get me through the four months in which I was shut down. And there's where I believe we're confusing accounting principles with what that money was truly intended to do, which was to give it to us to support our businesses, to keep us open, to keep our employees off the the, uh, the unemployment ranks, which by the way, that's another very important piece. Had they gone to the unemployment ranks, I would have never been able to open back up in July. Had I not kept those employees, who knows what would have happened to try and get them back. So it was incredibly important for us to be able to maintain, not just keep them off the, the unemployment ranks, but to basically have them available as we, when we opened back up. So, and, and that is true with the second round to be able to maintain uh, uh, future and, and, and as we continue to wait for consumer confidence, at least in our industry, and I believe that's true in hospitality and restaurants, the restaurant industry, to be able to wait for that consumer confidence to come back. Because I don't believe any of us back in September thought January was going to be the month that it was in terms of the pandemic. And that significantly impacted our businesses again. So uh, I, I would hate to think that we confuse accounting practices on how businesses were able to retain these funds with a need to retain them to keep our businesses whole, not just for now, but into the future, because we've lost not just the revenue, we've lost the profits. And those profits allow us not just to pay taxes, they allow us to continue to grow our businesses in the state. Thank you. Are you all set, Representative Spilsbury? All set, thank you. Any further questions? Saying none, thank you for your testimony, Mr. Benton. Anybody else wish to, oh, what? Uh, hold on, to testify for or against? Saying none, I'm going to ask the DRA uh, if you would let. Like. Senator Major? Yes. Uh, Jerry Stringham just put his hand up. Okay, would you let him in? Okay. Yes, are you hearing me okay? Yes. Yeah. 
Um, very, very good seeing you all. Uh, uh, I just um, wanted to draw from my own experience with the PPP. Um, I think Representative Spillsbury uh, has uh, the math correct. Um, uh, I received uh, a PPP as part of my business um, uh, to the extent that the uh, employees that I was able to retain with the PPP were productive uh, and enhanced my revenues. Um, uh, you know that becomes uh, that becomes profitable, uh, and um, uh, to the extent uh, that there would be uh, no business, uh, I would have been able to write off and I did write off all of those uh, expenses uh, last year, and I would not be paying any uh, any BPT uh, on on the PPP money that I received. Um, uh, what the uh, mechanism for uh, receiving? Um, uh, the funds and the forgiveness. I did receive the funds last year. Uh, it went into the books as a loan. Uh, his, uh, it was still officially a loan as of the first of the year, as the uh, loan forgiveness paperwork um, wasn't completed until March. So it'll show up as, as, uh, as uh, income uh, uh, non-taxable for federal purposes in my 2021 uh, income but all the payroll and everything that, uh, uh, and other um, uh, expenses that were part of the justification for the PPP uh, what actually um, was incurred last year. Um, I, you know, personally, I have no problem paying um, uh, business profit tax uh, in, in the state of New Hampshire. Uh, for the apportioned part of the revenue that's associated with New Hampshire, um, uh, because um, you know that those funds really came in pretty much similar to the way that any other grant or revenue comes into the business, and uh, it was very helpful and appreciated uh, and to the extent um, uh, that uh, you know the the rest of the revenues and profits uh, held up. Uh, I'd be paying the same amount of same amount of tax. Uh, I think there would be a difference, you know, for for a struggling business with a BET, uh, which you can pay even if you're you're um, uh, uh, even if you're unprofitable. So, um, uh, uh, you know, while past speakers have talked about, you know, the ability to retain profits is important for future growth. I think um, uh, I'm okay keeping uh, most of it uh, and um, uh, paying some, some for the state for the opportunity uh, to thrive and succeed uh, in the Granite State. And, um, uh, you know, I think the pro program worked pretty well and it doesn't, it doesn't need to be tax free uh, to, um, uh, to meet its purpose. Uh, in fact, by in, in part by making it uh, taxable uh, for those that it really helped uh, provide a lifeline to, they wouldn't be paying B, uh, BPT anyway. And for those who it was just uh, additional uh, revenue and additional bottom line, the BPT tax uh, would go up a bit. So um, uh, my, uh, uh, you know, in light, in light of what, what I've heard from the committee and from the others, I thought I would add my own perspective I hope it was helpful and be happy to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you, uh, Jerry. Always good to hear from you. Uh, questions, uh, Representative uh, Hacken Phillips. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, and thank you, Mr. Stringham for taking my question. I'm just wondering what your uh, business industry might be. Which sector do you participate? Yeah, I'm a, I'm a consultant. Um, uh, with employees in, in multiple states in the healthcare technology field. So we help uh, companies that uh, uh, are developing uh, uh, new medical products. Are you all set? Okay, uh, Representative Abronni. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, my buddy here, uh, former Representative Stringham. Uh, I'm trying to glean from this. Are, are, are you supporting, would you support this bill if you were with us? Uh, 
I, I would support I would su support the status quo that the uh, BPT uh, the PPP not be deducted from the uh, uh, from the top line revenue of the company or or that it so. So you'd be a no vote on this bill. I believe so. Yeah. Okay. Just wanted to clarify that. Thank you. Further questions? Uh, and then thank you uh, for your testimony, Jerry. Edie, oh, Representative Almey, did you have a question? No, it was Representative Tucker. She has her hand. I, I don't have a question, but I do have a comment. I'm addicted to uh, the New Hampshire Business Review's book of lists. And I happen to have in front of me the 2020 magazine. Uh, I spill coffee on the cover, so I no longer have a cover on my coffee. But the, it's a compilation of a, a magazine of all of companies of any size, industries in New Hampshire. And on many of them, it lists the number of employees. And it is probably the most easy to obtain way to find out you know, how big a company is. And it's very interesting how well the top manufacturing companies in the state are mostly foreign owned that have over 500 employees and a tremendous number of employees are at Dartmouth Hitchcock and so forth. But you can see it, it is very useful to have something that's accessible that has the number of employees. And I think it's the easiest way. It's, it's just very, very accessible. And it has the names of the people and their addresses and ownership. So it's all together uh, in one place. So they put it out every year and I don't know whether uh, 2021 is out. It's not what I found, I found 2020, uh, but it's, when I do a business story, it's one of the places I start. So there was just, because I know everyone is interested in, because of the 500 on this uh, well, that's, program. Long that's good reference, uh, uh, Representative Tucker. Thank you. Anybody else have a comment or a question on Senate Bill 3? Then I'm going to ask uh, someone from the RA, is it Carolyn or Lindsay? Um, Who do we have, Jenny? Carolyn and Melissa are in, but I also see uh, Devin Roderick. I'll I'll promote him as well. Good. Um, Is Lindsay there too? She doesn't appear to be anymore, no. Oh yeah, she's up top. That always happens. <laughs> they raise their hand and they jump the alphabetical cue. Okay. So, so now we have the staff of the DRA uh, with us. Yeah. So, Lindsay, do you have uh, any comments to make? Or, uh, good afternoon now, uh, Mr. Chair, members of the committee for the record, Lindsay Stubb, Commissioner at the New Hampshire Department of Revenue Administration. Um, I thought it would be helpful if you would indulge me for just a few minutes. I was just going to walk through and confirm um, what I believe is generally everyone's understanding about the issue that we're talking about here. And I will also walk through the fiscal note that the DRA has completed um, and which you received a copy of our fiscal note quick guide. So at a high level, we are talking about the taxability of forgiven PPP loans. Again, importantly, these are the loans that have been forgiven. And once they're forgiven, there is currently a difference between the tax treatment at the federal level and at the state level. Currently at the state level, PPP loans that are forgiven become grants and they are taxed the same as any other grant. This means that the amount is included in the business's gross income and any 
um, amounts that are spent on deductible expenses, such as wages, um, can be deducted. So the full amount of the forgiven PPP loan would come into gross income. And in instances where all of that money was spent on deductible expenses, those expenses will be subtracted out and the net impact to BPT will be zero. Um, a tax, tax would be paid on any amounts that were not spent or were spent on non-deductible expenses, although I suspect that amounts spent on non-deductible expenses would be minimal given um, the purpose of the loans, which became grants. So that's the state treatment. Again, coming into gross income, deductions for any expenses that are deductible, and then you're hitting BPT for anything that is not deductible or that was not spent. At the federal level, PPP loans that have been forgiven are not included in gross income. So they never come into the gross income of the business, but the expenses can still be deducted. So anytime um, the loans were spent on wages or other deductible expenses, they would be subtracted from gross income, but the grant or forgiven loan amount would not be included. This essentially results in an additional benefit. You're going to be able to deduct expenses, which don't necessarily um, have an offsetting amount in gross income. So that's the difference between the state and the federal treatment. So what Senate Bill 3 does is conform us to the federal treatment, saying that the forgiven loan amounts, the grants uh, for PPP would not be in gross income, but um, we would still, businesses would still be able to deduct the expenses. I see a couple of hands raised. So Mr. Chair, I think I'll pause there um, to make sure we're all on the same page and then I can talk about the fiscal note. Okay, uh, Representative Malloy. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair. Thank you for uh, uh, allowing me to ask Commissioner a question here. Uh, what you just read, could you send that to us in print? <laughs> I would be more than happy to. It's a nice bulleted list. Yeah. Um, I refer to it frequently, so happy to that send it. That is wonderful. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Dennis. Uh, Representative Uri. Yes, thank you, Dennis. Uh, the, uh, oh, geez. the question I have, we're already in compliance with federal law on most of our other stuff. I think we passed a couple of laws that brought uh, New Hampshire up to uh, current uh, conformity with uh, IRS regulations. So if we passed SB3, we would merely be following the same path of trying to bring the two uh, at least parallel or as close as possible. Is, is that a correct analysis, Ms. Stepp? That's a great question. So you're correct, Representative Ullery. Over the past few years, um, we um, have updated our conformity to the Internal Revenue Code. So folks that have been on the committee for a long time will remember that um, New Hampshire went for a number of years not updating um, the Internal Revenue Code that we reference. Um, in the past few years, we have updated. So we currently reference the code as of December 31st of 2018. Um, we provide a memo to this committee um, every year that talks about the differences between the state and federal um, codes, the current federal code and the state code that we reference. I will note that when we do update our, um, our conformity, we do often what's called decouple from certain provisions in the federal code. Um, we do that for two or three different provisions typically because the feds have provided a very generous benefit and given um, the makeup of our tax structure, the potential fiscal impact is more than the legislature is willing to kind of swallow at that point. Um, what we're talking about here, you're correct that it is a difference between the state and federal treatment. This specific provision actually lives outside of the Internal Revenue Code. Um, so that's why we are needing to adopt um, this uh, federal treatment specifically in the language that is referenced in Senate Bill 3. So that's exactly what Senate Bill 3 does, is it mirrors the federal um, treatment similar to what we would do in terms of when we are conforming. Uh, thank you, Ms. Stepp. Like I always tell people there are two ways to create life, one of which is to create law or sue someone. <laughs> okay, Representative Almy, followed by Representative Bronte. Thank you. Um, Commissioner, if on um, what 
what would happen if uh, we have a case like uh, ex representative Stringham's where, which seems like it's going to be very common, um, they had the expenses, they, they used the, the loan to pay expenses, which were deductible last year. And even though they didn't have much revenue or any revenue last year, they filed and they deducted the expenses. And then this year, they finally get the loan forgiven into a grant on would, if we didn't do this, would they then have to, um, they would not have had any deductible expenses to weigh against it, is what I'm trying to say. Regardless of conformity to the federal treatment and regardless of Senate Bill 3, those expenses still remain deductible. They're spent on wages, rent, general expenses that operate your business. So there is, we're not talking about any change as to whether or not expenses are deductible. The only thing we're talking about is whether or not that forgiven loan or that grant should be treated like other grants and included in gross income or if you want to allow for a specific exception to PPP grants and have them not included in gross income. So really the only thing that we're talking about is whether or not that forgiven PPP amount goes in that top gross line, uh, gross income number. Thank you, could I have a follow up? A follow up? What I was talking about was um, if you're in on um, ex-representative Stringham's shoes, and uh, you reported the, the expenses were made in 20, in tax year 20, mm -hmm. and, but the, the grant occurs in 21 because it was a loan before. Are they allowed to take 2020 expenses and deduct them in 2021? They will not. Um, those expenses will remain deductible in 20. And I think we're, there's going to be a number of, of different issues here, and it's going to be potentially on a taxpayer, taxpayer by taxpayer basis. There was guidance put out by the IRS that um, encouraged taxpayers that if they reasonably believed that their PPP loan was going to be forgiven, that they could assume that forgiveness in 20. Um, uh, obviously unclear as to whether or not all taxpayers followed that guidance, and there may have been a variety of reasons why they did or did not. Um, also, it could depend on the accounting methodologies and various ways that taxpayers keep their books and records um, to determine where exactly the loan forgiveness and the expenses will fall. Um, so this is something that the CPAs and tax preparers will need to work with businesses on in terms of appropriately accounting for the expenses and also for the potential loan forgiveness. Okay, uh, Representative Bromney. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, uh, Commissioner Stepp, for uh, uh, providing the testimony. So, yes, we had this discussion a couple of years ago about conforming and not conforming, and we decided not to conform. Uh, it'd be a couple of years behind in all of what you just said about notifying us every year. Uh, the good example was Section 179, which was the accelerated depreciation was the amount that was, it was really high for uh, the federal level and not too high for us. Uh, <clears throat> so, so on March 3rd, 2020, when this bill was signed into law, all those conforming states became uh, conformed with this PPP change or, because there was no statute on the law that said that we would forgive anything it, it was just specific to this particular uh, provision. Is that correct? Correct. So states that have rolling conformity and just kind of roll with the punches, if you will, of the federal um, internal revenue code changes, um, they did essentially generally conform to this tax treatment, even though this does technically live outside of the internal revenue code, those states have just adopted the policy that we follow the federal treatment for taxes. States that are not rolling conformity like New Hampshire and many others are having these exact discussions um, where there is a decision whether to affirmatively adopt this federal treatment or not. And so that's why you see um, that there are some states that have not yet adopted this treatment, New Hampshire being one of them. And why if you look back over time, if you find older news articles, you'll see that in the beginning it was X number of states and over time more and more states have adopted 
that's because those non-rolling conformity states have made the affirmative decision through legislation that's passed through their House and their Senate and ultimately signed by their governor to adopt this federal treatment. Perfect. Uh, follow up? Follow up. So that's interesting. So they didn't automatically conform. Uh, they, they just, they chose to conform. Right, rolling conformity states essentially did automatically conform, but those states like New Hampshire that are static conformity, when we adopt as, as a specific date, those states are making these decisions individually. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, Representative Spillsbury. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Ms. Step, that last discussion you just had with uh, Representative Obrami anticipates my question. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm sure you're following those states which did not have rolling conformity and are making, uh, going through the same discussion. Uh, do you have any insights to what extent the discussion in those states is factoring in their ability to uh, draw a degree of offsetting income through the uh, uh, individual income tax? so that uh, where PPP funds have been used to, uh, to make payroll, um, there is a, a tax uh, receipt uh, to the state on that, or in fact, as uh, employees and others use the, uh, the money spent in PPP to go out and make purchases, there may be a, a sales tax, maybe harder to quantify a little bit uh, less direct, but still uh, uh, clearly there. Uh, so I, I'm, I guess I'm asking you to tell us whether you're able to gauge how much of a factor those offsetting revenue sources have been in other states who have those sources. I can't gauge, thank you for the question. I can't gauge specifically um, as to whether or not those other states have necessarily acknowledged that if they don't tax it at the corporate level, that there is still tax coming in, as you mentioned, at the individual income tax level, especially to the extent that, that the amounts were spent on wages, and at the sales tax level to the extent that the employees then continue to purchase things within the economy. Um, however, what, however, their revenue picture or their fiscal impact when looking at the impact of conforming to the federal treatment is different than the revenue impact that you're going to see here in New Hampshire. So when my counterpart in another state that has an income, individual income tax, broad-based individual income tax, and a broad-based sales tax is looking at the overall fiscal impact, it is going to look different than here in New Hampshire because while we have the negatives for the business profits tax, and other states would as well for their corporate income tax. We have a small corresponding um, positive impact with BET, which I'll talk about when we get to the fiscal note. And other in states with a broad-based income tax, individual income tax, would have a larger impact, positive impact at the individual income tax level. And again, at the sales tax level, to the extent that they are able to quantify it, as you said, it's probably a little bit more difficult. So their overall fiscal impact is going to look different than it does here in New Hampshire. And that would probably would inform their decision about whether or not to conform. Thank you. So the reciprocal point, I suppose, then would be if New Hampshire had either or both a personal income tax or a sales tax, your fiscal note would look different. Correct. And like I said, when we start, when I walk you through the fiscal note, you, you will see there is a positive in, impact for the business enterprise tax because wages are taxable under the business enterprise tax. But given that it is a much lower rate than a typical individual income tax rate, it's a smaller positive offset. Thank you. Thank you for that question, Representative Spillsbury. But uh, any further questions? Then why don't you continue? Uh, Sure, happy to. So the other thing that I wanted to do with you today was walk through our fiscal note and how we arrived at the fiscal impact. So before we get started, a couple things to note. Previous speakers have identified that our fiscal note has uh, had a bit of an evolution over uh, the process as Senate Bill 3 has made its way through both the Senate and now into the House. I will note that our first attempt at a fiscal note for this bill did have a revenue impact of approximately negative 80 million to a negative 135 million. Um, two things to note about that fiscal note. One, it was extremely complicated. 
um, and very difficult in order for us to convey um, all of the intricacies of how that fiscal note was derived. The second thing I will note is we heard some testimony in the Senate um, that um, questioned some of our methodology on that fiscal note. We take that testimony seriously. And so we kind of went back to the drawing board, hearing some of the feedback, um, and we're always happy to hear feedback. So we went back to the drawing board and developed a more simple, and we believe um, a slightly more accurate fiscal note. The methodology that I'm going to present to you this morning or this afternoon is the, our updated methodology. And in the Senate that produced a fiscal impact of a loss of 65.1 million. You'll see what you have in front of you today has a loss of 91.7 million. The only difference there is that the 65.1 million was using total PPP um, loans as of August 8th of 2020. We have now updated the total PPP amount to reflect those loans issued as of April 18th of 2021. So it's just an, um, essentially updating the base of where we're starting from to account for essentially the second round of PPP loans that have been issued. And again, we're only talking about PPP loans that have been issued through April 18th. So this analysis does not contemplate the additional 30 billion or so um, that is still remaining that could potentially be issued through May 31st. So the fiscal note, as I said, starts with total PPP issued as of April 18th, 2021, which is $762 billion. We then subtract out 20% for PPP that was issued to nonprofits and to businesses that are under our taxable thresholds of $50,000. That 20% number is an assumption, um, and that's based on our general review of the data for PPP loans that were issued to New Hampshire businesses only. I'll pause here for a second. You'll hear me say multiple times as I go through this that there's a lot of assumptions. So we are making a lot of assumptions about the data. Um, the data that we receive from the Small Business Administration is the same data that is available to you and to the public. Um, we don't have taxpayer identification numbers, so we're not able to tie the data specifically back to our individual tax records to know how certain businesses, this might ultimately flow into their tax return. So, we're not using necessarily any of our data or our specific information about taxpayers in order to arrive at this analysis. So we are making a lot of general assumptions. So taking the 762 billion, subtracting again 20% being those businesses that are below our BPT threshold and also those businesses that are not subject to BPT because they're nonprofits, that arrives at $610 billion. And the next thing we do is apply a 0.4% apportionment to New Hampshire. I've heard the committee this morning talk a lot about New Hampshire businesses that have received PPP. And those businesses are certainly very likely to be subject to tax here in New Hampshire. You also have businesses whose address is not in New Hampshire that may still be subject to tax here. Regional New England businesses, you may have a business in Massachusetts, um, that owns property or locations in both states, but their headquarters are in Massachusetts. So those businesses wouldn't show when we're just looking at the New Hampshire data. So that's why we start with the whole pot of total PPP, because we could have businesses across the country that received PPP that apportioned to New Hampshire and therefore file a tax return here in New Hampshire. So that 0.4% is a number that we've used routinely over the years. It's generally based on population, but it's a way that anytime we're looking at a national number, if we wanna um, decide or try to approximate what portion is attributable to New Hampshire, we use 0.4%. So again, a number you may have seen in our fiscal notes in the past. And again, it's just trying to say, total United States, what portion is New Hampshire? So applying that 0.4%, you arrive at 2.4 billion. So that is our estimate of total PPP that um, could be taxable here in New Hampshire. Um, again, would not include anyone that's not subject to the BPT. 
and does include businesses outside of New Hampshire that apportion here. So the first thing we do is apply the 7.7% BPT rate to the 2.4 billion. And that results in just under 185 million of additional benefit that businesses would receive if PPP, forgiven PPP loans were not included in gross income. We then start to whittle that number down. So the next thing we do is assume that 80% of that amount was spent on wages and therefore would be subject to the BET. Again, the 80% is more than the 60% that was required under the program, but you've heard some testimony this morning that many businesses did um, primarily spend these amounts on wages. So we have assumed a slightly higher percent at 80%. So if 80% of the 2.4 billion was spent on wages, that gives you $2 billion spent on wages using the bet rate of 0.6% results in a bet liability of 11.7 million. So we take that 11.7 million and we reduce that uh, or take that away from the 185 million of the initial BPT loss, which results in 173.1 million. So again, you had a loss, but as Representative Spillsbury mentioned, there is some benefit there because we have that tax on the wages. So we've reduced that loss by uh, the 11.7 million. The next thing we do is um, acknowledge that we have businesses, the way that our BET and BPT taxes interact, we have businesses who absent BET would pay BPT, but because BET is in credit against BPT, the only thing they pay is BET. And so they wouldn't experience this additional benefit because their bet is in excess of their BPT. So they always pay more in bet than their BPT liability. So they always offset each other. And based on our analysis, looking at our data, this is the one place where we really dug into our data, approximately 47% of our taxpayers are bet only taxpayers. So again, this, um, additional benefit that would be available under the BPT would not impact these taxpayers because they only pay bet. So we take that reduced 173.1 million, apply the 47%, and that's how we get to the 91.7 million. So again, at a high level, we took total PPP, determined the portion that we believed would be subject to the business profits tax. We apportioned it to New Hampshire, applied the BPT rate, creating our loss, reduced that loss by the bet that was generated because this, these amounts were spent on wages, and then accounted for those taxpayers that only pay bet and are not BPT taxpayers. And that's how we arrive at the 91.7 million. Again, using total PPP issued through April 18th. I will stop there and happy to answer any questions. Well, it looks like, it looks like Norm, where did Norm go? Well, I'll, 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 I'll assume the chair role here and I'm, I've got a question. So, uh, is Norm back? No, okay. Uh, Commissioner, um, we, we all got a, uh, an email from uh, you folks, it was either yesterday or this morning, uh, talking about the second drawer, uh, <clears throat> which started in, uh, uh, was enacted at the end of December and it goes through May 31st. So, and, and, and New Hampshire's portion of that was going to be 290 billion uh, of additional loans, uh, and the the email said that 240 billion has already been awarded. Now we just heard testimony from bank associations. She threw out a number of 30 billion, but I, we know that's fluid. So, but let's say it's 50 billion that still still hasn't gone out as yet. Um, so when when we look at the date on your, your, in the fiscal note, that your starting point, that 762 billion, 
Mm -hmm. uh, it was as of 418, to best of your knowledge, uh, that that still unknown is the 50 billion as to what are those loans are going to be made and forgiven. Uh, and so uh, it would be very helpful to the committee, I think, uh, that uh, over the next week or two for us to estimate how much of that 50 billion, uh, I, I would assume it would, it would make this estimate go up a little bit uh, uh, because there's still 50 billion unaccounted for so far as I can see uh, that uh, may be forgiven. Uh, that's, you know, so can you just address that where we're at with that whole analysis? Sure, we'd be happy to um, update the fiscal analysis, assuming again that the total of the second um, round of PPP is issued. It sound like, sounded like Christy alluded to the fact that they believe that will be true. So we can certainly update the fiscal note using the full amount. The second thing I would note is that this analysis does assume that all PPP loans are forgiven. Um, looking at data from the SBA website, um, as the best as I can decipher it, it looks like to date for the forgiveness applications that they've processed, only 0.3% have not been forgiven. Um, a very small percentage, but I will note that our analysis does assume that everything that is issued will be forgiven. Right. Okay, so, all right, so, um, so even if, even if in the next couple of weeks, uh, or next week, can you take the maximum amount and do your estimate? Certainly. That's what you're going to do, and then we can assume it'll fall somewhere between where we're at now and the, and the maximum amount. Okay, thank you. Sure. I see, uh, Chairman uh, Major. Good morning, everybody, but I, I had to drop off because I was frozen. Mm -hmm. Couldn't communicate, so I just came back. So sorry about about that. Uh, now, Lindsay, where are we? Right. You, you had just completed the analysis of the ninety-one point seven million. And Correct. I, and I was in the process of making a statement. <laughs> did you hear the statement? I did not hear the statement. So, if you'd be willing to repeat that, that would be helpful. <laughs> it's a small statement, but. Um, <laughs> The, your analysis is based upon as of April 18th. And then we know that this loan period extends to application to the end of May, but there's only 30 billion left. And if you multiply that by 0 0.4, that's, that's a small amount. So it's not going to affect the 91.7 million much. Is that a correct statement? I believe that to be a correct statement. Representative Obrami asked um, a similar question, and I did agree to update the analysis, assuming that the total amount is issued so we can get you an updated number. Um, the other thing I did note is that the analysis does assume that all PPP will be forgiven. Um, looking at the data that the SBA has made available to date with respect to the processing of forgiveness, it appears as though only 0.3% of loans that have been processed for forgiveness have not been forgiven. So it is a relatively low percentage of loans that are not forgiven. So our, again, our analysis does assume that all PPP will be forgiven. Well, that's pretty good as far as an analysis goes. <laughs> We know we could rely on you guys. Okay, further questions of, uh, uh, I can't see that if I put the participants up. Uh, Representative Ames, followed by Representative Almy. Representative, okay. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so first, uh, I guess this is a, a question to the chair. Uh, Will there be a work session of follow up uh, to look more closely at the um, basically the fiscal note side of this, the impact question? Excellent question. There definitely will be. And there's probably be more than one work session because we still need the 
need guidance from the treasury to affect things. And uh, we need the latest up to date information from the DRA. And we, we need to talk about this amongst ourselves. There's a number of questions that were raised today and we need those answers. And we'll hold off on this until we get that or until the, as long as we can before we exact it. Great, I think that's essential and I appreciate that. Um, and then uh, the immediate question is uh, related to our surge in revenues and the question of whether um, DRA knows um, if there is, if there have been revenues received that reflect payments by taxpayers of uh, taxes under the current law um, on, on a PPP loan proceeds that may lead subsequently if SB3 is enacted to a refund request. Good question to ask before Lindsay answers that. Let me add to that is that uh, over the weekend I talked to my accountant and and he reminded me that uh, he's processed an awful lot of returns that had to do with the PPP loans and they paid the taxes because they used the current law. He says that if Senate Bill 3 goes through as it is, we're going to see an awful lot of refunds. So uh, I'm anxious to hear what Lindsay has to say. Is she able to estimate uh, how things are going relative to that, how much of this excess revenue that we've been getting now is associated with what we may have to refund if Senate Bill 3 goes through as is. Sure, so I think that there's um, a, a couple different scenarios that we are seeing here. The first representative major, as you mentioned, is that businesses have accounted for PPP um, loan forgiveness in their 2020 tax returns. If that is the case, they have presumably done one of two things. They have filed and paid their tax return timely in either March or April, or they have paid the amount that they owe but have not yet filed their return. And they are taking advantage of the automatic seven month extension in order to file their return and will be receiving those returns in the fall. Yes. Let's talk about those two scenarios first. So in the first instance where they have filed their actual return, there is a line on our schedule four that asks them to report the amount of PPP that was not included in gross income on their federal return, but is included in gross income on their New Hampshire return. So we can start to look at those numbers. We will need to put those amounts through apportionment formulas and then apply the tax. So it's, it's a little bit of work for us, but we can certainly start doing that. And that will start to give us an idea of what we've seen. For um, businesses that are um, opting to file on extension, we have presumably the amount of money that they owe, but we don't know what portion of that is related to PPP because they haven't filed their final return yet. The other scenario that we have is what former Representative Stringham mentioned where they may be waiting for the actual forgiveness in order to account for that in their return. And so that may not happen until 2021. So we can start to put some, some guardrails and framework around what we've seen, but we don't have exact answers to that question. Yeah, the more knowledge we know about this, uh, we can prevent people from saying we have it, we can spend it now. and. We've got to prevent that or give them the knowledge so that they can make the decision not to do something like that. 
Certainly. So we can start to look at those numbers for you um, that have been reported on the returns and have that ready for, um, for your work session. Thank you. Uh, Representative Ames. No, uh, I'm sorry. If, if my hand is still up, it shouldn't be. Okay, Representative Al. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, huh, I, I had a question about how uh, Orders Edge fits into this when uh, subsidiaries and and um, subcontractors are um, are applying for PPP that cannot be applied for by the larger corporation. And um, I did find it in the Lebanon results, a neighbor who um, is a um, Is a, um, I'm not sure what the legal relationship is, but works within a corporation in Vermont that uh, does drainage work uh, and who uh, applied for PPP on his own in New Hampshire. Um, so I'm not, I'm not really sure how all of these things fit together, but whether on, um, would it make a difference or does your 47% account for that really? If um, there are a large number of small PPP applicants that received loans that became grants or will become grants um, and um, they are incorporated into filings under Water Edge, Water's Edge from the large taxpayers. Sure, so the, the simplest way I think to answer that question is how they file for New Hampshire tax purposes as a consolidated return potentially under as a Water's Edge Corporation, that may not be the same as how they filed for PPP. They're, they're two separate statutory requirements. And so again, how they file in New Hampshire may not be the same, how they lawfully file or correctly file in New Hampshire may not have been how they filed for PPP, but that doesn't mean that how they filed for PPP was wrong. Um, the, the requirements for how the number of employees were determined and the various other requirements in order to be eligible for PPP may have allowed for subsidiaries of who we view to be a large multinational Waters Edge Corporation they may have qualified under PPP under the law as drafted. So they're almost apples and oranges. Um, the 47%, that's a good question. That is based on our filings. So that assumes the Water's Edge consolidated return filing. So again, there may be a discrepancy there between um, how they file and how they may have been eligible for PPP. Thank you. And, and I had uh, a request also that um, main, we were asked to um, do the same thing for the Main Street program. I was told yeah, yesterday uh, by uh, Ms. Lear about um, uh, how much that, that is on your records and I'd like that to be given to the committee. Sure, we can certainly provide that. So you, you do mention a good point. Um, grants under Main Street and SELF and any of the other state programs using CARES Act funds um, do not have the same additional benefit afforded to them at the federal level and then obviously not at the state level. So a Main Street grant, for instance, a building business that received the full, the maximum Main Street amount of $350,000 that grant is included in taxable, uh, in gross income, excuse me, at the federal level, and the expenses can be deducted, which is the same as how we treat them at the state level as well. Um, but we'll get you the analysis, assuming that SB3 also applied to the Main Street and self grants. Right, and that would be true as long as Congress doesn't say, doesn't change the rules and make these other things retroactive. That is correct. Under current law as of today. Right. Representative Spillsbury. 
Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, you mentioned uh, earlier, Lindsay, that uh, naturally this affects all businesses subject to our business tax, regardless of whether they're domiciled in New Hampshire. So do we have any sense of um, how that breaks out proportionally? How much of this would effectively benefit non-New Hampshire businesses? Not specifically because, again, I can't tie the data to our individual records. Um, so without the identification numbers, I can't look to a specific business's apportionment to know how exactly um, they would in, it would impact New Hampshire businesses versus not New Hampshire. I, I, I suppose that's probably the answer you were going to give, but uh, in light of that, uh, is it probable that it's a significant percentage? I would say as a whole, the majority of our revenues obviously come from businesses that are not domiciled here in New Hampshire. You know, we have one state and one business, one state's worth of businesses, and we have 50 states worth of businesses that could be conducting business here. Um, where that analysis gets tricky is when you start to consider as Representative Almi was alluded, alluding to, obviously the largest portion of our revenues come from large multinational organizations that are unlikely to have been able to get PPP. Um, and so when you start taking those out of the equation, I don't have a good handle on how that likely impacts the New Hampshire portion of businesses to the total portion of businesses. Obviously it starts to dilute it. Um, and again, just based on the 0.4% apportionment that we typically use. And again, that's based on population. Um, I would say that the majority of businesses that would benefit from this um, would be businesses that are not domiciled in New Hampshire, but obviously businesses that are domiciled in New Hampshire would benefit from this as well. A quick follow-up, if I may. Follow-up. Now, purely hypothetical, so I, I only want to sort of refer to this. But if we were in the single sales factor stage already, that would make it even more complicated and undeterminable, wouldn't it? It would most likely because um, sales, well, one, we would have to be a couple years in or at least a full year into single sales factors so that we would have that data off of our returns. Um, and then also one of the things with single sales factor is it is the most volatile factor when it comes to apportionment. Obviously your sales in any given state can change pretty easily from year to year. A good marketing campaign in Texas could really you know, drive up your sales in Texas where property and payroll are factors that tend to be more stable over time. Um, so yes, if we were in single sales, um, especially during a pandemic, um, the data would be a little more volatile and would make our analysis potentially more difficult. You're, you're confirming exactly what I suspected. <laughs> uh, further questions of Lindsay? Do you have anything else to add, Lindsay? I do not. We will get you the follow-up information, which I have in my notes as the um, bulleted overview of the difference between the state and federal treatment that I went over at the beginning. We will put the full amount of potential PPP to be issued through our analysis to give you um, an updated fiscal note, taking that into account. We will start to analyze the numbers that we've received on the schedule four re for returns we've received to date that report PPP amounts. And we'll also calculate the impact if um, Senate Bill 3 um, was expanded to include the um, state level Main Street and South programs. Okay, well, thank you. Uh, any further questions from the committee? And then thank you again, Lindsay. Very thank you very much. Nice to see everyone. Uh, is there anybody else, Janine? No, there's not. Um, no. All right. Does anybody else wish to comment or have questions or contribute to the public hearing on Senate Bill 3? If not, I'm going to close the public hearing on Senate Bill 3, and I would anticipate we would be having at least a couple of work sessions on Senate Bill 3. 
And I, I would also encourage the members to throw the information that they have, especially the information uh, that have been provided on the other states on what percentage of their revenues come from, say, income tax, sales tax, corporate tax, and all that. Because when you start making decisions on what other states do, you got to analyze how is that going to affect New Hampshire. New Hampshire is different than all the other states. New Hampshire is the only state without a broad-based sales tax and a broad-based income tax. Therefore, New Hampshire cannot recover any additional funds due to PPP loans. These other states with an income tax and a sales tax, if they do not tax the, the PPP loans, still get the benefit of the tax on wages and the sales tax on goods and services. Uh, so you've got to remember all these things. They all tie together. So anybody else have anything else they want to contribute? If not, um, we will go right into our next bill, which I think will be very short. And our last bill. which is Senate Bill 112. I, I would take a break, but I don't think this is gonna last. Oh, wait a minute. Um, but it's only fair to ask you, do you wanna take a break and come back in 30 minutes? Or do you wanna plow through this? No, I don't wanna take a second. Plow through. Oh, plow through, okay, thank you. This is a public hearing on Senate Bill 112, an act relative to historic racing. And we did a side-by-side -side comparison on this bill compared to Senate Bill uh, two, uh, 626. And then uh, there's essentially no difference except a few minor word changes, which doesn't change the, the intent of the bill. So essentially, Senate Bill 12 appears, Senate Bill 12 is the same thing as, as House Bill 626, which passed out of com committee in the Senate last week, five to, uh, five to zero, and it's going to be on the consent calendar in the Senate. We have signed up for that, three people. Uh, and they're all in support. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, the first is opposing. Do we have? Um, it, French here? In place of Senator French, we have uh, Representative Grant Bossy. And uh, Representative Bossy, you're going to uh, introduce the bill for Senator French? Yes, at your uh, indulgence, Mr. Chairman. Go ahead. Uh, Representative Bossy. Uh, thank you, non-representative. Um, uh, good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. My name is Grant Bossy. I'm the Majority Policy Director for the New Hampshire Senate. Here today on behalf of Senator French, the prime sponsor of Senate Bill 112, he is not available and asked me to introduce the bill. He thanks you for your courtesy. Uh, Senate Bill 112 would establish paramutual pools for historic house racing. The Senate approved it with a strong vote of 20 to four. Um, and as the chairman said, the issue is quite familiar to you, ha having approved a nearly identical bill, House Bill 626, just last month. That bill is scheduled to be heard by the full Senate on Thursday, so it, it could be on its way to the governor uh, before you get around to this bill. Uh, historic racing pools would provide another option for the licensed game operators currently working in New Hampshire and would generate an estimated $12.2 million annually for the Education Trust Fund, as well as $6 million a year for local charities. I defer on the subject matter experts on the details of the bill. Senator French thanks you for your consideration and ask for your support for Senate Bill 112. Thank you very much. 
And do you take questions? Uh, I could, um, but I'd likely have to uh, take down the question and take it to Senator French and he'd give an answer back to you. Thank you, Mr. Bossi. Um, the next, if I take him in order of the sign up, is a Michael Remy from Keene, New Hampshire, an elected official opposing uh, Representative Rem Remy. Is Representative Remy? I just let him in. Okay. Representative Remy? Hello, I'm uh, Mr. Chair. Thank you uh, all for having me. I'm actually a city councilor in the city of Keene. Uh, I'm not particularly opposed or in favor of the language itself for the bill. I, I think that this, I mean, it's, it's up to the group as far as uh, what the, uh, the right decision is here. But what I am a little bit uh, disappointed in is that the current date that's chosen excludes one uh, license holder. And that one license holder happens to be in the city of Keene. And I, I find that that's a little bit disappointing that uh, there was a floor amendment to this bill that was proposed uh, by Senator Kahn um, that was, uh, was declined that would adjust the date to December 31st of 2020 instead of May. Um, and that would have included this last license holder who opened a business during COVID. And now we're uh, excluding them for some reason from being able to participate in this, uh, this opportunity. So while I'm not a speaking in favor or opposed to the bill itself, I do find it disappointing that we would exclude one person from this. And I, I said the same thing before the Senate when they were reviewing 626. Thank you for your testimony. You take questions? If I, I'm not sure what I can answer, but I would be happy to take any questions. Uh, Representative Early. followed by Representative Schamberg. Representative Early. Representative Urlich? Yeah, I'm just trying to find the bleeping turn off button. Uh, if this is, uh, this is a question of the chair, sir. If this bill is identical to the other bill, would it not be appropriate for us at this time to do essentially nothing because the other bill is already passed the Senate? That is up to the committee. Re Representative Schoenberg. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I guess this is a question for someone that wrote Bill 626. Was Kane excluded in that bill also? Uh, Representative Bromney, do you want to respond to that? Uh, yeah, so in, in both uh, 626 and, oh, sorry. Go ahead and explain that, Representative. Sorry. Uh, sorry. Uh, in both 626 and uh, and 112, they were both um, they were both set to that May date. I'm not sure what the significance of that date was, but it is excluded in both. So unfortunately, that 626 has already passed this committee. Thank you. Okay. Uh, any further questions? Seeing none. Thank you for your testimony. The next is Michael Affelberg. From Nashville, New Hampshire, a member of the public uh, representing the United Way of Greater Nashua and support. I do not see this person here. Okay, the next is well, He's not going to be here either. Not there. No. And there's nobody else speaking. There is a total of 47 in support of the bill, three opposed. Anybody else wish to speak on this bill? So Please. I did, I would. Uh, Representative Tucker. If there's, I gather that the fact that it's passed um, both houses means we don't have to really consider this. I would certainly go along with that. You said that it was up to the committee. Perhaps you could pose the question. You know how to word it correctly. I'm going to let the uh, public hearing continue until the end. Oh, I see. I didn't realize they were in conflict. Sorry. And then when we go into an executive session, which is not today, we can handle that. 
Ah, uh, I see. Okay, thank you. R Representative Bromley. This is going to have to be testimony because uh, I'm a co-sponsor on uh, Senate Bill 112 as well. So, so <clears throat> Representative Rami, uh, Markham 19. So uh, I did have conversation with both uh, Senator Gaida as well as Senator French, and uh, they're all in agreement that that uh, that Senate, uh, House Bill 626 be the vehicle, and that. Uh, they have no problem that uh, if we retain this or whatever we decide to do, uh, because the other bill is, is already on the way. Uh, I think it's on consent calendar in the Senate. So uh, <clears throat> so it's all but, I think, passed. <laughs> so um, I see uh, Grant, Grant has his hand up. <laughs> but yeah, I could, I could address that. It is on the consent calendar. There were two floor amendments, one to change the date and address that keen operator that was defeated on the Senate floor the first time. Uh, and on this bill and the second was a local option, essentially allowing the municipality to decide whether these would be allowed. That was also defeated by the full Senate. Um, it is on the consent calendar. It may be taken off the consent calendar, but it got a 20 to four vote. I would anticipate passage and heading into the governor's desk. That would leave you in possession of a Senate bill um, that you could, you know, work your will on. Thank you for responding, Bossy. Uh, anything else, Representative Bromley? No, I, I think we are, the Senate and the Senate Ways and Means and House leadership anyway is, is in a kind of agreement as to what should happen next. And we can talk about that when we, we bring up the uh, bill for uh, vote. All right. Um, since we won't be going in executive session, anybody else wish to speak in, in favor or in opposition to Senate Bill 112? I don't see any hands raised. So I'm gonna close the public hearing on Senate Bill 112. Uh, that ends our public hearing today. I want to remind everybody that tomorrow we're going to be meeting uh, with the LBA and the DRA and talk revenues. And that will start tomorrow at, get the right time. 10 o'clock. 10 o'clock. Anybody else? Any further business? If not, we are adjourned. And thank you for hanging in there today. <laughs>